it's announcement time and we've got a lot going on, but we've had a lot going on all the way since last Sabbath afternoon. Kind of some leadership meetings. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, last Sabbath, we had all of our leaders for the new term, which starts in July. So they're not fully active yet, right. unless they're continuing on. And we had a luncheon and some meetings with them, just casting vision. We and have, then we had some training midweek. Yes. Because we're basically we trying to transition the church from just, uh, uh, well, basically to a more participatory, right? Yes. And we want to say, though, a huge thank you to all of those who have been Absolutely. serving and who are currently serving until July. Uh, they man, kind of served an extra year or two COVID. because of COVID. So yeah. an extra thank you, shout out to all of those that have been such solid leaders for years in this church. And we're going to be doing something special for them as well. Yeah. Now, during we want to make point out that during the services today, we're going to be first service. We're doing a commissioning and ordination of elders. And we're doing the same, the deacons. This is all part of uh, a vision, a discipleship focused vision. And you're gonna be hearing more of that throughout the year. So I'm uh, excited. Yeah, now one of the things that with all this leadership training that we've just started, it's just brand new, all of this doesn't work unless there's prayer. And that's why we've connected it. Now we've been already started Thursday evening. We started our prayer conference and we continue that today, including this afternoon it concludes, it's at four o'clock in o'clock. the sanctuary um, and you're not gonna wanna miss it. Even if you've missed the others, it'll be a mer- very meaningful service. Uh, Pastor Randy is gonna be sharing in that. There'll be opportunities for prayer. And also at the end, if someone wants it after the service, there'll be an opportunity for anointing as well. We love our kids here at the University Church and our children's department under Pastor Shauna Campbell have been doing a magnificent job with our kids. All the leaders, everyone, just thank you. A shout out to all the leaders and uh, the children's department. But here is a video of our kids letting you know what's happening for VBS this summer. Wow, it's here too! Wait a minute, what's this all about? It's going to be Vacation Bible School. I think it's from June 12 to 16. It's going to be at night at 6.30 to 8 o'clock. It's going to be fun. It's going to be so cool. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. The kids did a really great job on that, didn't they? They're so cute. (laughs) Yeah. Well, our next announcement, our annual memorial service is coming up. Here's Pastor Adrian to tell us more. Happy Sabbath, friends. Losing a loved one is probably the most difficult experience anyone could have. The one thing that makes the burden a little lighter is being surrounded by family and friends who offer their love and consolation during this difficult time. Here at the Loma Linda University Church, we reach out to our bereaved families at the time of their grief. And once a year, we celebrate the lives of those who have passed on. Two weeks from today, on May 21st, we will have our annual memorial service. Our theme this year is Forever in Our Hearts. This service promises to bring comfort, support, and encouragement to those of you who have lost a precious loved one during this past year or at any time in your life. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our music department is having their annual spring concert next Sabbath, May 14 at five o'clock in the sanctuary. This concert is entitled, And Grace Will Lead Me Home. We have our full choir, orchestra, wonderful musicians. So come out and join us at five o'clock next Sabbath, May the 14th. Well, that's our announcements for today. And as we always say, for more information or the latest information, go to our website, LOUC.org. And if you are visiting with us, we really would love for you to come out to the Uconnect Center. Let us know you're here, where you're from. We can answer any questions. We just wanna meet you and welcome here to our church. And for all of you at home and in the sanctuary watching, we love you guys. Have a terrific Sabbath day.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful May Southern California Sabbath. We're delighted to have you here. It's always a delight to welcome not only those of you who are here in the congregation, but any who might be joining us through the broadcast, through LLBN or one of the other platforms. We're delighted to have you as well. And we especially want to recognize our mothers. We want to say Happy Mother's Day one day in advance to you, to welcome you to our worship service, and to thank you because without you, we wouldn't be here. So we're very grateful to our moms this morning. As you know, Loma Linda University Church focuses on discipleship. An integral component of discipleship is prayer. Every year at this time, the weekend of the National Prayer Day, we have a prayer conference. I'm Delighted and want to thank Anita and her team for the planning of this prayer conference. So tell us a little bit, Anita, about the prayer conference. Yes, thank you. So we started already at Thursday evening with our first meetings, and uh, then last night, and then today, and we will culminate this evening with the Vespers. It has been a wonderful season of prayer already, and praising God and worshiping. Our theme is very special, and it goes along with what the church at large has been doing for the better part of the year, the, cal the school calendar year, yes, which um, is you know, training disciples and hearing that call and saying, here I am, Lord, send me. And we have had wonderful speakers from different ages. I have been blessed beyond measure. Um, we had, uh, the first one was Nicole Schwelt. Uh, she's 17 years old, a junior in high school, and she blessed us with uh, a wonderful message Thursday night, last night, from the Praxis group, Kelly Lynn, and uh, this morning we have a surprise. You can tell us about it. So we're very delighted to have different people who are part of our lay membership, who are helping to lead out and who are speaking. Anita is right. If you missed either Thursday night or Friday night, I would urge you to go back and watch. So this morning our speaker is Carissa Vitorovich. Carissa came through our program here in clinical ministry and in chaplaincy. In fact, she was in my preaching class, and I remember listening to her sermon and thinking, God has blessed this person with unique abilities and skills, and I think you will find that to be true. So we're looking forward to Carissa's sermon this morning. Anything else, Anita, in the lobby or any other things that people can participate in? Yes. For those of you who have been attending already, you should have received a printed booklet, a printed copy of the entire weekend. Now, if you're here and you did not receive one, uh, we should be showing the QR code on our screens right about now. There it is. You can just um, take a picture of that, scan it, and then you will automatically, immediately have the whole booklet at hand on your smartphones. And if you would like a copy of it, I think we have a few extras in the back. But yes, this booklet outlines the entire weekend and all the different opportunities. Um, but one other opportunity that we have, if you came through the lobby this morning, you saw that there are five different prayer stations. Opportunities for you to focus and prayer. There's a prayer wall there for you to write your prayer request. Um, but we especially want you to look at also the other ones. Uh, you Reach has a table that features the work they do with homeless and how much they need your prayers and your support. Uh, we have a table um, that tells you about human trafficking, praying a you know, for the victims of human traffic and, and maybe pondering what God would have you do. And then we have one for refugees with pictures and things that you can also uh, list, um, volunteer to be a prayer partner and others. So we invite you to do that as well. So there are many rich, abundant opportunities for prayer to pray for deep and real needs in the world. We look forward to seeing you this afternoon. There will be a special program this afternoon that will include an anointing service as it happens every year. If God is urging you in that direction, it might prove to be a deeply meaningful experience. It will also be a time of dedication to leadership, right? Yes. Because we have ordination this morning and dedication to leaders this afternoon during the afternoon service. So we want to thank you for being a part of this worship service and the whole prayer weekend. Anytime I think about prayer, I journey back to Second Chronicles chapter 7, 
which may be one of the most important passages on prayer in Scripture. God speaks and says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will heal their land. Welcome to worship. This is a special time in our service where I know each one of you, myself included, have special things on our hearts and on our minds, special petitions personally, maybe something we're going through with relationships, maybe it's financial, maybe it's, it's health, maybe you have someone on your heart and your mind, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a coworker. We all have things that we just want to bring to the Lord in prayer. And I want to invite any of you who would like to join me right here in front for a season of prayer so that we can pray together. I want to invite you right now just to come down and to join me bringing these petitions, either personal ones or ones that you're carrying for someone else right down here to the front. God is good and he listens. He hears the cries that are in our hearts and he knows what each one of you is facing. So as you come down, there's room right in here. Don't be bashful. Uh, come on down. And if you're still coming, if we start to pray, you can continue to come forward. But we're going to lift our cry to God this morning. Let's bow our heads. 
Mighty God, there are really no adequate words to describe you, your majesty, your, your splendor, your love, your grace. Everything about you is so perfect that when we look at ourselves, we fail in comparison. But Lord, it is our desire to be more like you in every way, that you would seep through the pores of our being and that we would reflect you to others, our families, our friends, our coworkers. And this morning, Father, we come before you, each one of us, those that are here in the front and also those in the pews and those at home, Lord, this world is hard. There is no way other than to say that we don't understand everything that happens in life. We don't understand the answers that you give us. We don't understand sometimes when you are silent. And right now, we each have something that we are bringing to you, Father. Maybe a friend, maybe a child, maybe a spouse or a significant other. Lord, it may be our own situation. Maybe we're struggling financially. We don't know how in the world we're going to pay the next bill. Father, maybe we are struggling with health issues physically. Maybe we, we got a diagnosis, but Lord, maybe we are struggling and we've been to the doctor and they can't figure out what what is going on with us, and it's affecting our living, our day-to-day -day living. Father, maybe we're just struggling with our relationship with you. We don't understand you, and, and we just need to hear from you. So, Father, whatever the situation is here this morning, we want to lay it before you at your feet. You are a God who hears, you are a God who cares, and you said to bring our broken hearts. You say to bring um, all of the people that are in need of healing. You say where two or more are gathered, there you are, and we are claiming your promises this morning. Lord, heal us, heal our friends, heal our nation, heal this world. We are in desperate need of you. Pour out your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the young man comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what can I do to inherit everlasting life? And I can just imagine that pensive as Jesus is, he lets out a sigh. See, there's a problem with the question. Not that the desire of salvation is wrong, but the question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? I can just picture him saying, son, you don't need to do anything. Eternal life is already yours. It's your birthright. And too often we come to church asking the same question. What do we need to do in order to become acceptable to you. And today, today we get to ask a different kind of question. We get to ask the question, how do we respond to the gift of eternal life? 
How do we invest ourselves in what Christ continues to do as he builds a kingdom here in Loma Linda? And make no mistake about it, this kingdom doesn't belong to us, it doesn't belong to you. It's all about what he has done and what he continues to do. So this is the part of the service where you get to respond to what God is doing. Through your talents, through your tithes, through your offerings. If you believe in the ministries of this church, if we believe in what Jesus continues to do, through our diverse ministries, all the way from cradle roll until, well, you know, if you believe what he is doing in and through this local body, won't you give? Father, what do we need to do to inherit eternal life? What shall we bring? What shall we give? You need to do nothing. Just celebrate in the reality of Christ crucified and Jesus, the risen Lord.
Wow, it's a very special Sabbath today. We have three candidates to be baptized. More on that later. But I want to introduce to you Danica Wacker. She's a very dear friend and a very special young lady. She comes from a very special family. She's the eldest daughter of Chris and Liana Wacker. She's the granddaughter of Charlene and Duane. How many know who Charlene and Duane are? We laid to rest Duane just a few weeks ago, and she is thinking about her grandpa Duane even now. Danica knows that as we stand in the baptistry tank, that it is a symbol of standing in the watery grave and to dying to the old person of sin and to be reborn in newness of Jesus Christ. She understands that. She also understands that she joins the ranks of this church, Loma Linda University, and she is now a Seventh-day Adventist on the books officially. I have to take a moment to describe my relationship with this precious family. When I was just accepting ministry as a part-time youth worker, Duane and Charlene came to me and ministered to me and my new wife, Susie. And then I became a pastor, and I got to minister to Chris and Carmen, uh, Dwayne and Charlene's kids. And then he became our pediatric dentist, and he ministered again to my three children. And I remember the first day they went to the dentist, they couldn't wait to go back. Chris and his precious team made, uh, made friends with my three kids, and it's amazing. And then I get to minister to Chris's daughter, Danica. It has been a very special relationship, and I love the Wackers. In fact, a large group of the family is here. I see Candace. I would like the friends and family of Danica to stand right now in support of this very special day. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Danica has proven to be very bright and very aware of what she's doing. She has a younger sister, she has a lot of friends who are watching this moment. Baptism is a very unique moment. It's where a private decision to follow Jesus becomes a very public announcement. And that's beautiful. So she is fully aware of making a public declaration for her love and her intentions to follow Jesus Christ wherever he might lead. And she brings joy and a gigantic smile and a beautiful spirit to every room that she enters. So, Danica, because you love Jesus Christ and because you want to live for him, it gives me great joy to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we also celebrate Rebecca O, oh, who was baptized in the Holy Land with her father, Pastor Joey, and she is the daughter of Sarah and Joey O, oh, and we celebrate her as well as another baptismal candidate in the third service. Friends, if you have thought about baptism, we would love to follow up with you. See one of the pastors or one of the many elders of this church. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Pastor Doug. What a beautiful baptism. And we do have many elders. We're just coming out of the DLT, Discipleship Leadership Team process, which is a new name and a new structure for the nominating committee. And we're going to ordain our new elders today. And there are many of them. The DLT identified people who were spiritual leaders, and those leaders today are going to receive the support and the endorsement of this congregation. I'd like to invite them to come forward. They'll come forward and kind of fill in the space behind us. I want to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Richard Bloom Johnston, who is serving as our head elder. And Richard, you have some things to say to these colleagues that are joining us. I do. Thank you, Randy. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, 
losing my mic. I'll, I'll fix it for you here, Richard. There we go. Thanks. Now we're good. <laughs> good morning. Um, the process of choosing, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Randy, and I would like to thank the pastors and you as a congregation for allowing Terry and I to continue to serve you. It has been a humbling blessing to us, and we are excited to continue in this ministry. The process, we've been asked a number of times how these people are chosen as elders. Um, what happens in our church is our pastors identify people within their ministry that show a spiritual depth and a spiritual wisdom, a commitment to the church, a commitment to the gospel and to the Bible, and that have in their own life a foundation that they are willing to share with other people. What they have done then is they bring these names to the DLT committee that uh, Pastor Randy mentioned, and then the DLT committee goes through these names again, and they vet them, and then they determine if they will become, in fact, elders for the specific areas of ministry of this church. So that is how it is, is done. Pastors identify willing spiritual people. The DLT determines whether or not they will actually serve. Um, the benefit of this is a number of things, but probably mostly is that it gives the pastors an, a specific team to work with so that they can uh, further build their ministry. And in addition, it gives the elder a direct pastoral connection so that they can be taught and, and mentored uh, more in the spiritual areas of ministry. The elders, we'd like to say a couple of words to use directly this morning. We want you to take this position and embrace it. We want you to embrace it with your heart, embrace it with your soul, make this ministry in your specific area of ministry and in your life a real thing. We want you to deeply pray about this ministry that you are involved with. Pray for the pastors, pray for the pastor specifically that you are working with, and most of all, pray that God will give you patience, wisdom, and humbleness. In addition, Okay, we would like you to pray for the congregation, for this is what we are here for, to serve God, first of all, and to be a shepherd to the congregation. So I'd like to leave you with what I feel is the most important instruction for an elder from Scripture, and that's 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under you. Watch over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Elders, we pray for you, I pray for you, and we welcome you. Amen. We're going to have a prayer of ordination, but I want to make sure we have enough. We have other elders and pastors. Okay. Pastor Phil, can you move down in behind these folk here? We just want to make sure that we're all come right on over. We have a couple people up here in case you hadn't noticed. So we're good over here on this side. Very good. It's good to see you. And I think we're good now. So we want to invite you as a congregation to join us as we pray ordaining these beloved leaders and colleagues here in our congregation to the work of the elder. Pray with me. Gracious God, what a joy it is to come with this group of friends, deeply loved friends, leaders in this congregation, people involved in every ministry. Lord, every one of them is deeply involved and has proven to be a spiritual leader and a foundational person in that ministry. And for that reason, their names have been brought forward and endorsed and brought here before our congregation today to be ordained as elders. So, Lord, it's our privilege as pastors, as ordained elders, to lay our hands on them, just praying that the Spirit of Jesus might descend upon them, might fill them with the love of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, His passion for people, and that this group might lead our congregation in two things, deepening our love for God and broadening our love for others. Amen. Lord, bless them, ordain them with your spirit, and bless us is our prayer. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you each and every one. What a joy and what a delight it is. Amen.
One day, my, my family just called me. My mom called me. She said, hey, you need to pray because your grandpa is in the hospital right now. He knew like I was a Christian since I was little, but I can never picture that he will pray with me together or say, oh yeah, I'm interested in your God. I just can never picture that. I don't know if I finish the college and go back, will I still be able to see him? What if my grandpa pass away and I miss the chance like forever. So I was thinking if I can go back even for two weeks, I want to introduce Jesus to him. You know, I first came, I was a student, I don't have a job. The price of the ticket is super expensive, like around like 2000 something, the round trip. So I was like, oh, there's no way I can go back. I just start to pray, I say, God, would you please do something? I know you could, but why it seems like you're not, not answering my prayer? I was in the choir, so I think after three days, that was the last concert. Before the concert started, and we were standing on the stage, we were introducing ourselves. So anyways, the concert finished, and then just all of a sudden, there's a lady just come to me, she said, Hi, your name is Angel, right? I was like, oh, hi, just in, you know, like being polite. And she said, you say you're from China? Uh, so are you going back this Christmas? I was like, uh, maybe. <laughs> I kind of like, you know, just be quick and then don't want to share any details. And she just said, maybe, what stop you from going back? I said, oh, you know, it's really far and then the ticket is really expensive. And so I don't know. So she just said, um, so tell me what are you going to do if you're going back? 
I just feel like it's quite interesting, you know, like no one really come to you and directly ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So I just like, okay, maybe I can share a little bit. I just told her, oh yeah, I would definitely go back to visit my family because my grandpa's sick and then I want to go back to see him. I just feel like I have a burden. I need to let him know God. And then all of a sudden this lady just said, let's do a prayer. Let's pray together, see how God can lead you. And in her prayer, she just mentioned one sentence that caught my attention. She just said, God, tell me how can I help her? How can I help her? And I was like, I didn't expect her to help me in any ways. And then I don't know why she said that. So after the prayer, there's someone just bring the Christmas gift to her. And she said, this is quite early, I think. This is really God telling me what to do. And she asked me, how much is the ticket for you to go back? So I told her it's around like 2000, it's quite expensive. And she said, give me your folder. And she just put an envelope in there. And then she wrote another check. And then she passed it back to me. She just said, open it. In the folder, there's a whole bunch of cash. So add up together, it's just like, I think it's 2000 something exactly for me to go home. So immediately I just started to cry. My tears just coming down. I'm like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. And she say, well, you don't need to say anything because this is not my money. This is the money God prepared. And then God just showing me that you're the one needing this. Eventually I booked the ticket and then I find a long time with my grandpa, and just, I just start to share with him. I said, Grandpa, do you know how did I get back? My grandpa said, how did you come back? I said, I pray to God. I say, God, I need to see my grandpa. And there's a stranger lady. She just prepared this money for me to come back to see you. He, he, he become like, he becomes silent for, for, a, for a second. He just look at me, he say, Really? I said, yes. And then the Holy Spirit just kind of touched me. So I say, Grandpa, do you believe there's God? And he just said, yes. <laughs> and I said, do you believe that he loves you? He just nodded his head. I was like, there's no way. My grandpa, I can never picture him being a Christian, you know? It's really God. So uh, during that three months, sometimes I just see him like cross his finger and lean, lay, lean down there. Seems like he's doing a prayer. And then by the end of three months, I know I can leave like peacefully. So I left end of December and I came back in March. And in May, my mom called me, my grandpa passed away. I know I've done my job. I know God sent me back, has a special um, plans for my grandpa. Yeah, which I can never picture or imagine. Good morning, church family. Our scripture this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See. This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me.
By any account, Michael May has lived an incredible life. As a three-time Olympian, he won three bronze medal medals in various alpine skiing events. Michael went on to become a CIA employee and later a very successful inventor. All of these accomplishments become even more extraordinary when you learn that since the age of three, Michael has been fully blind. A chemical explosion, again, at the young age of three, left him blind in both eyes. And though this did not keep him from succeeding in many of his dreams, in many of these incredible aspirations, there is one thing that Michael May missed. One thing he was unable to experience. Michael had never seen the face of his beautiful wife had never looked upon the childish joy of his two young boys. That is, until 1999, when a revolutionary surgery became available. Michael had the promise or the hope of having his sight restored, or at least in one eye. But this came with great physical and also emotional risks. What if the procedure was not successful? Michael recalls sitting there on the hospital bed as the bandages were removed. And for the first time, looking into the bright blue eyes of his little boy. Would you ever forget that moment? The moment when you looked into the faces of your loved ones for the very first time. To what lengths would you have traveled to see the light? Heavenly Father God, we're so thankful to be here today on this Sabbath day. We come before you, Father, to worship you as the God and the creator that you are. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit may today speak and you alone. And Father, may we see your light. In the name of your Son, I do pray. Amen. It was a time of great stress, a political intrigue. Fear of war was real and present reality. And no, I am not speaking of our world today, but rather thousands of years ago, as recorded in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. And the Bible records, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It's not uncommon to record the year of, or to keep track based upon the year of the king's death or the year of his ascension. But what is especially noteworthy here is how this stress, this statement would have brought great stress to biblical readers. You see, when a king died, that was a time of incredible instability. That is when your nation is at its weakest. That is when all of your enemies are just waiting with excitement to attack. Believing the new king will be unprepared for war. This was especially true in the case of King Uzziah, who during much of his reign was continually battling back the ruthless Assyrian army. And you can imagine how greatly they rejoiced upon the news 
that King Uzziah was dead. And yet, while the enemies rejoiced, the townspeople began to mutter back and forth, what will happen to us? Will we be safe? Will there be war? What will our future hold? It's as though in this scene, recorded in Isaiah chapter 6, the camera that was focused on the death of King Uzziah begins to slowly pan up. Away from the darkness, away from the fear, and up to another king, to a king who remained on his throne, to the one king who could not fail, to the one who was not dead, but yet very much alive. The experience of Isaiah, listed here on our slide, the experience of Isaiah was very similar to other great leaders of faith, including Moses, Amos, Daniel, Ezekiel, and John on the lonely isle of Patmos. They all saw the Lord revealed in his glory. Continuing, in the SDA Bible commentary we read, when perils encompass God's people and the power of darkness seems about to prevail, God calls upon them to see him seated upon his throne and directing in the affairs of heaven and earth, encouraged or in order that they may take hope and courage. In times of great crisis and every day in between, God calls his followers to look up from the darkness, from the disappointment of the world, and to see that he remains seated on his throne. Have your eyes looked up from the chaos in the world? Have you seen the light? Overwhelmed by the glory of God, Isaiah begins to cry out to God, Woe is me, for I am undone. Have you ever had that experience in your life before where you feel your weakness, where you feel shame? where you feel your insufficiencies and you cry out to God, God, who am I? Woe is me, for I am undone. I had the opportunity to travel to the beautiful country of India. And I remember one night standing in front of a full-length mirror carefully draping my sari on that had been gifted to me by a friend in the community. I was excited to go to church that night in this beautiful sari. Thus, I had spent the afternoon on YouTube looking to see how do you properly wrap a sari. And of course, YouTube videos always make it look rather easy. And thus, I began with great hope. And as I looked in the mirror, I was actually quite impressed. I had indeed been able to wrap it. It was all covered and layered as it should be. And so with joy at my accomplishment, I began to hurry out the stairs to my vehicle that was waiting to take me to church a motorcycle. <laughs> and I would soon commence to ride side saddle on a motorcycle, <laughs> flying through, and yes, I do mean flying through the streets there in India. But you see, first I had a little problem. 
As I walked outside, already anticipating the joyous expressions of the church members when they saw me in my sari, I instead had what soon became the most embarrassing experience of my life, or at least up to that time. As my sari began to unravel, And soon I am running across the street, and I have loads of fabric in my hands, and I'm trying to hold it in all the right places. And what do you do? As you are about to depart for church. Seeing two little neighbor girls across the way with whom I had previously played soccer, I looked at them in distress and they returned that look. <laughs> they quickly ushered me over to their home and, and opened the door, and the mom came out and looked at me with shock as she immediately saw my dilemma. Within five minutes flat, there I was in their living room home, eating a full gourmet meal, as the mom wrapped me up and used at least two dozen safety pens to make sure this didn't happen again. <laughs> And how often we too can think that our garb is in place, that it is firmly as it should be, and yet we cry, woe is me, for I am undone. This too being the experience of Isaiah. As he saw the incredible glory of God before him, he could not help but cry out, Woe is me, for I am done. done. In Isaiah 5, just a few verses before, Isaiah was also crying out woes. Woes to them. Woes to those people. Woes to all the ways that they have messed up. But after seeing the tangible glory of God in Isaiah 6, Isaiah's prayer changes. Lord, woe is me, for I am the sinner, for I am the one in need of mercy. And Isaiah's prayer was heard. When we come into the presence of God, we see ourselves as we truly are. But we also see a Savior who is more than able to cleanse. I remember meeting a woman who I will refer to as Ruby. Ruby deeply impacted my life. I was involved with some church meetings up in Northern California, and Ruby began to attend. And one night, one of the church members came to me after the program, and they said, Ruby doesn't have a ride home tonight, so I told her that you would be willing to take her. So after the meeting, I began to drive Ruby home and to get to know her better. And as we drove deeper and deeper into downtown, I instinctively locked my doors as I approached the streets I later learned she called her home. See, Ruby was a prostitute selling her body for drugs. She continued to come to our meetings, and by the grace of God, Ruby surrendered her life to Jesus Christ. A few nights later, that joy I had seen in Ruby's face was replaced with deep sadness. She remained in church after everyone else was leaving, and, and she's sobbing, she's crying. And I go over to Ruby and I say, you know, what happened? Are, are you okay? To which she quickly responded, how could God forgive me? How could he ever forgive me for the things that I have done? I was a prostitute. I lived a life 
opposed to him, how could he want me? With a comforting hand on her shoulder, I opened my Bible and I said, Ruby, tonight God has a promise that he wrote especially for you. And together we read 2 Corinthians 5, 17 where the promise is given, if any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Today, Ruby, when Jesus looks at you, he does not see a former prostitute. He does not see a former drug addict. Today, Ruby, when Jesus looks at you, he sees his daughter who is deeply loved. In Jesus, all things are new. Today, and perhaps this week, as we have looked at Isaiah 6, as we have entered into that deeper experience through prayer with God, some of us may be feeling that sense that I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. We're trying to cover that shame with a sorry that is unraveling. And yet today, God's promise remains for us. In Christ, we are a new creation. In Christ, his healing is free. In Christ, his grace is abundant. Shame does not need to be carried any longer, for that shame is not yours to bear. Jesus takes it for us. In theory, we know of the grace of God, but have we believed the light? Moments later, the voice rings out once more, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? I want you to notice the immediacy of this call. Notice God did not say, well, hold on a second there, Isaiah. We want to test you for a couple years just to see if this was a genuine conversion. I know you're excited about getting in ministry and all that, but why don't you just sit down and make yourself comfortable? I want to see if this actually lasts. That wasn't God's response at all. The moment Isaiah's heart was converted, when he saw God and he turned his heart to him, immediately the call was given. Who will go for us? My husband and I have been married for less than two years. So I guess we still qualify as newlyweds. And certainly it was recent enough that I very much still remember when he asked me out for our first date. And as you may have experienced on first dates, naturally you want to come to the date with like a checklist of 500 items. (laughs) Like forget the roses and the chocolate, right? Let's get to business here. (laughs) Is this going to work or not? All those essential questions. What are your values? What are your interests? Do you like pineapple on pizza? (laughs) All the non-negotiables that go into a happy marriage. And I'm happy again to, you know, spoiler alert, we both passed. But these questions are important, and certainly if you're applying for a job, you ask questions. When do I start? What is the job description? What is the pay? There are questions that are asked. Interestingly enough, when Isaiah responds to this call of God, how many questions does he ask? No questions are listed. Rather, Isaiah immediately responds, here am I, send me. Now, I'm a planner. I need a little more information than that. But God, where? God, when? God, why? God, here am I, send me. Initially, we might wonder if this lack 
of questioning is rooted in Isaiah's personal knowledge of King Uzziah and his fall from the ministry of God. You see, King Uzziah, as was referenced in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, the beginning of our message, he once was a man of faith. And yet he blatantly disregarded God, going into the temple and performing a service that he was not called to perform. As a consequence of his actions, King Uzziah was struck with leprosy. The remainder of his days were lonely, isolated, as he suffered. Was this why Isaiah did not ask any questions? Afraid to anger God? Aye, aye, sir, wherever you send me, here I am. Is that why Isaiah responded as he did? And yet the context paints a very different picture. In fact, God was not even speaking to Isaiah when this passage was given. If you read the verse, again, in Isaiah chapter 6, and if you have your Bibles with me today, Isaiah chapter 6, and we are in verse 8, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? He was not speaking to Isaiah. Rather, it's as though he's having a conversation, and Isaiah is simply eavesdropping in. And in response, he is that little boy who's trying out for the baseball team. Ooh, pick me, pick me, pick me. Were you that child? Or maybe there was no need. You were first up to that. But here Isaiah is saying, pick pick me, God. I want to respond to that call. In contrast to King Uzziah, Isaiah's heart was attuned to God. And because he was connected with God, he heard the call. He implored God, much like the two discouraged believers on the road to Emmaus who, if they had not implored the stranger who was walking with them to stay, never would have known that stranger to actually be the risen Lord. Isaiah pressed into the presence of God. And yet how often we run to and from the presence of God as we rush about our days, as we hurry to get our kids off to childcare and to rush to work and clock in in time. We often have time for that, dear God, thank you for the day, bless this food, amen. And we run back through our day still carrying the same burdens that drove us to our knees. They have yet to be released. Do you have a lonely soul, God asks? That's my business. I heal those. Do you have a broken heart? I'm the savior. Are you afraid for what the future holds? I'm the one that calms your tomorrows. For I am already there. Not a moment in his presence as we hastily speed by but instead pressing in as Isaiah once did. There is an acronym I want to share with you called PRAY. And if you are feeling a little bit discouraged in your prayer walk, or you're just wanting to come a little closer or much closer to the presence of God, this is a good reminder for us. PRAY begins with praise. 
as Isaiah did, we come before God, seeing him as he is, praising him, yes, for the blessings we have, but even more so for the incredible God that he is. Secondarily, we can come before God and repent. As we see God for who he is, as we see his grace, we also see ourselves. Woe is me, Lord. Not, not woe are those people, but all in the world. But we look at ourselves and we say, God, woe is me. Forgive me for where I have fallen short. A represents ask. As Isaiah asked God, God, please, I have unclean lips. Cleanse them for me. And why is a reminder to yield, to yield those desires, to yield those passions to our God and to our Savior. Yielding is an indication of a trusting relationship. And so also, if that is our desire to yield our lives to God, that can only come through knowing he's worthy of receiving our lives through knowing that our lives are indeed safe with him. Today, we too can echo the prayer of Isaiah. Lord, here I am. Lord, send me. But where will we go, you may naturally ask. What does that mean? It could mean that God is calling you to go across the globe. It could mean that God is calling you to a foreign land. It could mean that God is calling you to go down the street to your neighbor, to go to the other cubicle to your coworker that is exhausted. It could mean going down the hallway and giving a hug to your child and helping them see the love of God expressed in you. Where will I go? That's up to God. Only he knows the answer. But today, one question does remain. To what length will you travel? to be the light. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Heavenly Father God, Lord, I thank you so much that you have, through your word, shown us your glory. Thank you, Father, that we can look up from pain, we can look up from chaos, we can look up from confusion, we can look up from the worries of this world, and we see that there is a king, there is a God who does not fail. There is a God who reigns forever. And so, Father, with this knowledge, we come to you, and we come in repentance, Lord, asking for your cleansing, and not only for your cleansing, Father, we pray that we may actually believe in it, that we may no longer carry shame or guilt but instead release it to you as our Lord, our Savior, and our King, the one who has already borne the burden for us. And so, Father, it is with great joy that we come to you, thanking you for the opportunity to yield our lives to you. Father, we come to you, and and maybe we come with questions. We want to know what this means and what the future holds, and yet, God, we take these questions and we put them to you at your throne of grace. God, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds the future, Father. And we rest it in your arms. But Father, today, collectively, in unison, we say, here am I, send me. May your spirit lead us and bless us, is my prayer. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.
uniting lives. Blessing nations, celebrate. Welcome to this special Mother's Day edition of Week in Review right here on the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Sheila Hodgkins is off on assignment, but Ganim and I are here to uh, give you the update of what's been going on behind the scenes of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network this week. Uh, we have the verses of the day that is uh, coming up, but uh, let me introduce to you today's sponsor of the live broadcast of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network here in Sabbath. Uh, thanks to the Knight family from Oklahoma, also the Nuremberg from California, and from Florida, the Clayton Patrick family, and of course, uh, the Masseys there in Florida. So thank you so much for your support. And these are just a few of the names that uh, uh, contribute to the LLBN uh, daily support. But these are special. Why? Well, because they're part of the live broadcast. Now, one would say, how do I become part of the live broadcast announcement? It's really more of a rotational uh, process. We try to give everyone the opportunity to have their name uh, service on spo uh, Sabbath sponsorship live. That's our peak time for viewership from Friday night through Saturday night. So uh, we just like to take the opportunity during the live hours to make this announcement. But right now it's time for the verse of the day, uh, or shall we say verses, get them? Yes, mm -hmm. verses. Well, you know, with Mother's Day being a great occasion for all of us, one here comes from Exodus, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. Well, you know, um, we all need to honor our mothers, whether we're men or women. Honoring our mother and father is very critical. And uh, this is Mother's Day weekend, and, and our mothers deserve special love and attention and recognition, which we should be doing all the time, Marlon, all the, all the time. But uh, it's a great day to reset our uh, our. our our compass to say, remember your mother. Mm, public recognition. Yes, sir. There's another one from uh, Proverbs 1, 8, 9. It says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. How important that is. And, and so truthful because I grew up in a home. Uh, my mom was pretty much the teacher of life. For me, uh, she set a perfect example. She laid the instruction. She made it clear that all came in combination with great love. Uh, so uh, mother teaching is very, very important. And thank you, moms, for mm -hmm. taking time out of your life and devoting your life to teach your children. And fortunately, some of that is disappearing in some areas of the world and cities. Uh, but through God's grace, we still have wonderful and faithful <clears throat> mothers out there who does provide good foundation for their children. Well, the Bible tells us that um, we are to live Jesus Christ all day long. Uh, we're supposed to wake up with uh, thoughts of him to tell our children, and not only our children, but our spouse and our brothers and sisters and uh, our right. mothers. And, and that instruction is so pivotal because the early years are the formation years. Yeah. The Bible ta talks about training up a child in, in the way of the Lord, and yeah. if he departs, he, sh he will return. That's my story, as a matter of fact, mm. uh, and that's your story as well. Mm. What else do you have for about mothers? Well, again, I'm, 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 I'm using verses here just to identify love, and I associate love with faithful mothers who love their children. Uh, John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment, this is from Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. And this is where a mother comes to mind because most mothers that I've known in my lifetime, they have made huge sacrifices for their children and they have loved, they have loved their ch children dearly. And uh, so this verse just kind of reminds me of the love God has given to humanity. Um, in John 15, 13, it says, greater Love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So it, it's just Fighting wonderful. Nations,
One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Fantastic. I love hearing the buzz of noise and conversation. Here's the only problem. We are about 50 seconds over our Sabbath school time. So those of you who are here for the Sabbath school panel, find yourselves a seat. Those of you who are still talking, find yourselves an exit or a seat exit or seat i am going to invite us as we begin our program to pray and as we pray i will hope that we find the presence of god as we discuss about some practical ways in which you and i can find and define our faith walk so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer Father, we want to just thank you for your blessings. We want to thank you for this time, this special program when we get to converse and we get to expound and explore. We get to expound on our concepts of listening to you. And we get to explore what you have to tell us. So today, Father, we would simply pray that you stay with us here and that you continue moving and speaking in and through us for we pray in your name amen we want to welcome all of you to this special panel and we want to especially welcome those of you who are seeing us at home through any of our virtual platforms our llbn family our friends over there at loma linda broadcasting network we have so many friends and so many viewers that come from far and wide and we just are so thankful now as you can probably tell we are not in our current studio we are live and i'm just remembering why producing a live show with a live audience is sometimes chaotic but we are here expecting and praying that god's blessing be continued to be felt now I'm very excited because today we get to talk about listening to God. And it's a question that I'm sure all of you at some point have asked yourselves. How do we listen to God? How do we explore this idea that the ancient church fathers used to call discernment? And today we're going to take it from the realm of the ethereal and we're going to actually ground it in practical experience. So we're going to have a panel discussion with four friends, four people that I have come to respect and admire. We've got the lovely Rebecca Murdoch, and Becky is a longtime member of our church. She has been active with several ministries, uh, prayer ministries. She's also very active with our bereavement ministries, and she has a passion for family life in how to bring your family together. One of these things that I found as I was listening to Becky talk about her passion for families was we've lost that notion that worship is something that the whole family participates in. So hopefully we'll be able to hear from a family perspective as Becky moderates how we can listen to God better in the context of our family. Next to Becky, we have Harvey Elder. Harvey is a retired physician. He is also an elder of our church. He is a longtime member of our prayer ministries. If you have called our prayer line during the weekends, you will have heard either Harvey or his lovely wife, Grace, lead that prayer walk. And every time Harvey prays for you, something happens and he prays because his life has such a deep understanding and such a deep experience of who God is and what God is doing 
And so he prays for us out of what we like to call the overflow. So Harvey, we're very excited about what you will have to share today. Next to Harvey, we have our friend Brad Rafius. Brad raised four children in this church. He is the proud grandpa of a beautiful, just the cutest baby that, I, that I've seen. It's just adorable. And he's also an elder. He's very involved with prayer ministries. He's also involved with Connecting Place and some of our study ministries. And last but not least, we have the lovely Rosie Salcedo. Rosie is a newly coined elder. If you were here for first service and her ordination, you would have seen her. She is also working with, throughout this prayer conference, helping out with the garden of prayer so rosie we are so glad that you are here and friends we just are excited about what god is going to say through the lives and the experiences of these lovely people so friends the time is yours we are just going to sit and huddle together if, as if we were in a living room listening to four friends talk about prayer exactly thank you so much miguel this is just like we were in a living room and I am so honored to be with friends. It makes me feel comfortable. And what we're going to do this morning as we learn or on this journey to hearing the call of God, before we are sent, we need to hear, right? So what we're going to do with our friends, and I wish we had an opportunity to open the conversation up to each one that is here and each one in our viewing audience because as many individuals that are here and in our viewing audience, there's going to be a very unique journey, a very unique call to devotion. And so, but it's just the four of us, we're going to be personal. We are going to share our own individual stories. And then we're going to just make comments with each other, just like we're in a living room. I will begin with Dr. Harvey, and so Harvey, please share with us as a man of prayer and a man of God, what has been your spiritual practice or practices? Thank you for asking, Becky. <clears throat> I was essentially born in church. My folks were very faithful attenders of the Adventist church, and growing up, I knew the doctrines Name the doctrine, I could quote you four or five texts and give you references for another 20. I understood classic, quote unquote, the prophecies, and I could explain the classical meaning. And I was trying so hard to live a good life and falling, falling, falling. Absolutely certain my chances of heaven were so close to zero as to be impossible. I would pray at night after I went to bed and go to sleep praying and was sure I was showing God disrespect. And this, I would love to tell you, really improved when I went to an Adventist college. It didn't. It didn't improve in medical school. It didn't improve until I began to talk with and meet with people who knew Jesus. And I realized I didn't know Jesus. And they begin to teach me to pray to Jesus as a friend. And my prayers were fundamentally, help, I'm falling. And I would feel a hand lift me. And I began to realize I can tell when Jesus talks to me. It's like Several years ago with my late wife, she would shop at Nordstrom's in Montclair. And I would sit in the chair by the piano and read a book. And I would look up after a few hours, and here she was walking. How did I know? I knew her footsteps. I knew them well. You'd think after 60 years I should. I did. And it's the same with God. I hear him. I know it's him because he has talked to me. Thank you so much, Harvey, and especially for the personal, very rather vulnerable experience and sharing with us. Much appreciated. By the way, folks, uh, Rosie and Brad, if you have any comments to make about what Harvey 
has said or any questions, feel free. Otherwise, maybe I'll go ahead, Well, Rosie. I'd actually like to kind of echo what you said, Harvey. Um, and I've truly enjoyed your very uh, vulnerable sharing, you know, uh, with your life story and everything you've been through. God does speak just in the lowest of the lows. And uh, there have been times where I have felt utterly too broken to even be worthy to say anything or remember how to pray mm -hmm. except to say help. So when you said help, I just completely clued into that and I remember those moments. And that's good enough for God, isn't it? That's all God needs. He doesn't even need that much. All he, we need is to cry out in our inner soul and God is, hears us. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Uh, may I share a little bit next about what my spiritual sort of experience has been? Um, I'm just going to take time to look at some news. Uh, for me, quiet is important, right? In order to hear, in order to listen, we need quiet. It's so difficult, though, in our lives nowadays to find that quiet. And for each individual, it may be a different time of day. But now that my children are grown and gone and things are less chaotic in my own home, uh, quiet is easier to obtain. And I have just relished morning time. And uh, the quiet that I can enjoy <clears throat> as an introvert, <laughs> I like quiet. That's just how I operate. Um, one thing that has been absolutely life-changing for me has been the 7 a.m. prayer line. Thank you, COVID. The 7 a.m. prayer line has been a lifesaver, and it's brought me, as a night owl, not a morning person, to appreciate morning and the opportunity to meet. And even if I don't have a prayer, the prayers of the others become my prayers. And I've just found it wonderful. Time in scripture, time listening. So that's what quiet does for us, is it gives us an opportunity to listen. There are a couple of texts <clears throat> that I have found grounding for me. And we, Miguel and I were speaking about texts that ground us. Here are a couple. Psalms 143, eight says, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to the, know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. That's what we're asking God for. Where do you want me to walk? In the morning, I will listen and practice hearing your loving kindness throughout the day. In many different ways, we can hear and experience God's loving kindness. Another text I like is Psalms 90, verse 14. It says, satisfy me early with your mercy. There we go. In the morning, early. Then may I practice experiencing your mercy throughout the day. Isaiah 50, verse 46 says, Awaken my ear, morning by morning, awaken my ear to hear as one who is learning, one who is being taught. Lord, you open my ear and forgive me if I rebel and turn away. That is a grounding, some grounding text for me in my practice. And um, there are other things that we can discuss, but I don't want to take all the time. So please, Rosie, will you share with us something about your devotional experience? Well, my prayer life has been rather messy and not beautiful or highly disciplined, but I pray. I pray every day throughout the day. And it fits with who I am out of the box, not always following the rules, inventive, creative, being surprised by God. 
But in times of the deepest brokenness, where I felt that I have been a prayer warrior and prayers have not been answered, and I know we can all relate to that, deep brokenness, I have found that being still is a little bit different. It's not as disciplined as waking up in the morning at the same time every day and just being still. For me, it's in the chaos of life where I can literally take 30 seconds and I literally hear in my head, be still and know that I am God. Conversations can be happening. I may be on a tour. I may be sitting at a stoplight. And all I do is be still. And through my preparation of being with God and in prayer, it's those moments that God makes available to me a surprise. And I never know what it's going to be. But I do want to share something that was pretty wonderful. I had a prayer warrior that I used to pray with in Northern California. And I was saying, I just am praying so much, but I don't, I'm not getting answers. And we just said, we're going to just be still and see what God has to say. We're in the middle of a restaurant. This is how awesome God is. We're in the middle of a restaurant praying together, and a bird decides to fly into this restaurant and land right in front of my fork. That bird cocked its head, and I was thinking, oh, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to scare it away. But it looked right at my eyes. Our eyes met. Was that God? Absolutely. It's those amazing, beautiful surprises in the depths of our brokenness where we know, I'm here. I've got your back. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be eloquent. But that's the beauty of be still and know that I am God. Thank you so Thank much, you. Rosie. Yes, and I think several of us may be able to comment on that because one comment I want to make is that it is a different perspective because Rosie said it comes in chaos. And all of us have chaos, of course, in our lives. But... Um, that's just a different perspective of um, appreciating those moments. And uh, thank you so much, Rosie. Harvey, I believe you were going to say something. The, <clears throat> I didn't learn to pray by being mentored. I prayed out of my extremity. As uh, Becky said, I'm a physician. And there's times I'm talking to a patient. And I know there's something there I need to hear. And I don't know how to learn it. But I need to know. And I finally learned, God, I need to know. Tell me. And either in the silence the patient would say something that opened it up, or a word would come to me. And what happened with those experience, similar experience talking with students, I don't know what to say. I'm silent. But there's a, there's a brokenness I want to touch and see healing. And God says something. And it opens it up. I mean, there's times where he gives me a word, and I say, God, that doesn't make any sense. Do you want me to say it? I hear it again, and I say it. And the student has said, that's, impre that's so amazing. How did you know to say that? It's not me. It's God talking to me. And those experiences have given me a level of confidence. I'll be blatant. There is never an unanswered prayer. It's just I don't see the answer. Yes. And what God is teaching me is to open my eyes and to recognize him not doing what I asked was the answer to my prayer. I am so glad you said that, Brad. Go ahead and speak. Yeah. Well, Harvey was talking about he wasn't mentored in prayer. And I, I would like to share a little testimony here because I think I'm a very lucky guy because my first memories are waving that rainbow. Who made the beautiful rainbow in Sabbath school? So my very first memories up in Hazleton, British Columbia. You know, my mom was the leader. And then we had family worship every morning. We had family worship every afternoon, uh, evening. 
to say, and, and that was absolutely more important than breakfast for my mom. I mean, worship came first. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, you know, little friend, primary treasure, and all those, but we also prayed. And so, yeah, when I was little, I was not scared of the dark. I had a big, shiny angel right behind me that was going to look after me. I didn't have to worry about anything. That angel was right there for me. And as I grew up and went through school, and uh, we moved, and uh, we moved, and we moved, and you finally get, we were in, in America, and, uh, and it was interesting is that we, I could see God's leading in my life, but I did not hear him. Yeah. I did not hear him speak to me, and it finally came down to the point where I went through college, went through grad school, and I'd graduated from grad school. And I was looking for two very important things. One of them was the right lady, and the other one was the right job, because that sort of kicks you off after you graduate. And I was praying very hard. I was praying, I, six months I prayed on my knees. It was really, truly, no fasting, I will have to admit that. But it was strong prayer. And, uh, and one day, right here in Sabbath school, in our chapel, I was standing there, you know, looking for a seat, and this girl walked in front of me. And in my mind, I mean, as clear as a bell, that's the girl for you, Brad. <laughs> I'd never seen her before, didn't know her name. But all my troubles were over, you know. God had told me. Now, now she didn't know that, so. But that was the first time God really spoke very clearly into my mind. It was not something that I had to guess at. I knew. And it was it's not through my ears. It was in my mind. And that was the beginning of God speaking to me. And, and here was the good news. That girl also had a very good relationship with God. And she also heard him directly. So between the two of us, we have been able to take that and grow. And we can talk more about that. What a testimony. That's wonderful. That is an amazing testimony. It kind of reminds me of the story of little Samuel in the Bible, you know. Um, here's little Samuel, and he hears a voice at least three times, and he runs to high priest Eli. Poor old Eli didn't really know who was calling Samuel yet. Finally, he figured it out after about the fourth time, and Samuel he told Samuel what to say. Samuel went back, heard the voice again, and said, here I am, Lord, send me. And that's kind of what we're talking about. But another thing that I've heard mentioned up here is God speaking to us in our brokenness, in the chaos, in even times of abandonment, where we have exper not experienced the voice of God. Where are you, God? Where are you? Why am I alone? Um, I feel abandoned. Or the answer doesn't come, or maybe the answer does come. And I, I don't want to pick on you, Brad, but you told me a story the other day, and I'm just curious to follow up on it. It's about something that failed, that you had experienced, you believed it was God calling, and something had failed, and what that does to faith, where do we go from there um, when it's just not been worked out? Well, sometimes God just doesn't answer your prayers. You wonder, where are you, God? But sometimes God tells you to do something. Now, just think of Jonah and Nineveh. And uh, Jonah went the other way. But what about happens if they, you go the direction God tells you to go? And you do exactly what God tells you to do. And just like those men of Judah, when they go after Benjamin, they inquired of God and said, God, who should go? And God said, Judah. And Judah went to go and take care of that tribe of Benjamin. And guess what happened? They got beat. So they go back to God and say, what did we do wrong? God says, Judah, go again. So they went the second day. And they got beat up again. I mean, lost thousands of men. And it wasn't until the third time that Judah actually took Benjamin. Now, we didn't have any wars. But let me tell you, when we went and followed God's guidance, direct guidance, and we started a little school. And um, we, we felt very led. We had a very dedicated group, and we moved forward on that school. And I tell you, that school did not work out. A very sad story, that school fell apart. It did not work out. And to this day, you know, we have to ask God, what were we supposed to learn in that? And I'm telling you, we hope we learned the lesson that God was trying to teach us, because we don't want to ever have to go through that again. So, so the, sometimes I think that God does things for us. I mean, you can think of Job. You know, God and Satan were having a you know, discussion about Job, and Job never did find out why all those bad things happened to him. We know because we have the rest of the story. 
But sometimes I think that even when, you, and this is where the faith is developed, even when you follow God's leading, what happens when it doesn't work out? Is that God's fault? Or is it our fault? And, and I don't have the answers, but you know, sometimes we have to wonder why. And we may never get that answer. Um, what about your faith? Well, that, that develops faith. faith. That, that is the faith. Now, so what happens when God says no? That, that's sort of easy. You know, I think your faith is developed more in the trials when it doesn't happen than sometimes when God answers your prayers. And that's when true faith is developed. Go ahead, Harvey. Yeah. <clears throat> You see, when I asked for something, this is in the older days, I was very specific about notice, what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing in scripture that says what Harvey wants, he should get. I mean, I've looked for it, it's not there. <laughs> and so when I tell God what I want, remember, uh, expectation is preparing for bitterness. I didn't get it, and I wanted to be bitter. What I have learned is God knows much more than I do. Yes. And be I didn't get it because it would have ruined me. It would not have worked. It would have hurt other people. I will tell you kind of a pivotal, but in a sense, a funny story. I'd been married to my late wife about 30 years. And our marriage was one of these sawtooths. I'd love to tell you it was uphill, but it wasn't. We just sawtooth. And this is one of those peak, uh, valleys in the sawtooth relationship. I'm up on the fr out in the front stoop of the house, and I'm crying out aloud to God, God, when are you going to fix her? Notice the pronoun. And I heard God just as clearly as I can hear Becky say, Harvey, she's not the problem, you are. And I instinctively respond, I could have gone all day. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. I could have gone all day without hearing that. And I heard him say, but you asked the question. <laughs> and I realized I had some serious work to do. And our marriage improved dramatically, gradually after that. Now, that was an answer to prayer. It was, just wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you brought that story up. I've had a similar experience where I was praying, praying, praying. It was my first marriage. And I was a prayer warrior. I was reading every book on prayer at that time. And God just wasn't answering the prayers. And it came a time where I actually had to call the police. And I remember my home was surrounded by a SWAT team. And uh, I was in fear for my life. I was concerned about my children. And uh, I remember being s ushered out by uh, one of the SWAT team members, rifles all drawn, me screaming, please save my kids. And I remember they're just hiding behind a squad car, behind a wheel. God, where are you? Please save my kids. Fast forward, because I want to relate to what you just said, Harvey. I was so angry, I never wanted to enter a church again. God had failed me. Because I had had a personal relationship, I thought, with Jesus, I X'd him out of the picture and I said, okay, I'll just stick with God. And I'll just like, okay, I have to pray over my children, because I still have two. <laughs> but I just did not want anything to do with this personal God. And what's so wonderful is God had answered my prayers. He had protected us because I didn't know until years, years later that my first spouse had suffered from an incurable disease, a mental disease, a schizophrenia. So what had tripped me up in my lack of understanding and faith in God that God knew the best for us had actually been shrouded in protection. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, you know, we get in the way of ourselves. Like you were saying, it's all about me. Rosie, the, Rosie, the pain of your story is so palpable. It's so real. But God was there nonetheless. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Rosie, for being vulnerable again, and that is an extraordinary story. Um, question, where, where does God go when it hurts? Where does he go when we're broken? What happens to him when we feel this abandonment, this barrenness, say? A barren, dry period in, in our relationship with God. Have any of you experienced that? Um, I know I have. Mm. Barren, dry period. Where, where is he? Um, is it a feeling? Is, is the experiencing God a feeling that um, we have this presence around us? I would say no. I mean, that's my answer. I don't know what you would say, Brad, but I don't think the experience of God is necessarily a feeling. It's a belief. It's a conscious acceptance of faith that he is there. He's not gone anywhere. I think it's just unique for each one of us. Um, sometimes it's a knowing. Sometimes it is more academic. Uh, and sometimes it's a very heart-centered feeling. So I can't say it's prescriptive in my life because it's been so very different each time, but it's unequivocally God. That I can say and know. Um, I would have to say that my experience that God has been a lot like a marriage and uh, one of the most interesting weekends ever spent was in a, a marriage retreat or a marriage seminar. And the, the one thing I came out of that weekend retreat was is that marriage is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. It's a commitment. And we actually had a little heart that, with a magnet that got put on our refrigerator. And I think it's really the same thing with God. It's just not a feeling. I mean, you may have get some good feelings out of it. I would sure hope so. But at the same time, when you're really trying to have an experience with God, and you read Blackaby's book, it's about making a commitment. And I, I'll be so bold to say that commitment is time. You know, if you're going to really truly have an experience with God, you're going to have to make the time. What's the most important thing of your day? Look at the hours that you spend. Look at the waking hours you spend. And quite frankly, how many of those minutes or hours are God's tells everybody of your commitment. And so my, my encouragement to anybody there is that if you don't have a life or your, your relationship with God, not where you want it, try spending more time. That right off the bat, and, and at right time, you know, we can talk about which time is the best time too, but, but you know, it's different for different people, but that time is so important. And that's where the commitment comes, committing that time, so. I appreciate your analogy to, mar to marriage. And those of us that are married understand um, also the time, consistency, commitment, it is a lifelong task. Let's face it. This is not instantaneous. It's a lifelong task. It's a lifelong journey to growth in spiritual maturity. You were going to say something, Rosie. We've had this wonderful conversation before, I know, with Harvey. Sometimes we are committed. Sometimes we spend a lot of time, and we end up thinking that we're justified to think, to cast judgment around us. And so there's, I think there's another element to that, and I'd love for Harvey for you to share those moments in time where we've been so in the Word, we thought we knew what it was, but we never had put the Holy Spirit in front of us and the other person. Could you speak to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Rosie. <clears throat> I want to as you suggested, add something to the time. And I'm going to go to faith for a moment. And I'm going to give you a prag my pragmatic definition of faith. Faith is acting. Notice it's a verb. It's acting as if what I believe is true is true. Now, I told you I grew up with committed Christian parents. It didn't take as such, but I knew they trusted God by the way they lived. And I grew up with that. And so at my darkest time, when I was to pray to God, something deep within me said, God is still present. 
it was sometimes quiet, sometimes it was the middle of the night, sometimes it took days for me to hear that, but it was there. And because of your interest in parenting, I want to emphasize that. And as because it was there, I would spend the time, and the two go together. Time builds faith, faith requires time. The two go together. And out of that emerges love. Because as I began to see what God was doing, my heart opened up in response. And so I want to come back to, how do we do this? You start doing what God is telling you to do. Spend time. Read his word. Where? Start with Psalms. I didn't like Psalms. I finally, out of desperation, read it. And read it every month for three and a half years. And I, my life changed by that. Psalms. I love the Psalms because they can become prayers, right? So many Psalms are prayers. And we can make them our own. It's easy to do. By the way, just a little side, in your program, there are some beautiful prayers for each, um, each session that we have. Some beautiful, beautiful prayers. Make those your prayers. Um, Becky, thank yes. you so much for bringing that. I remember, and you just brought me back to this point, both of you, Harvey and, and Becky, when I did eventually return back to God, it was literally, God is so humorous, at a prayer conference. <laughs> and I had swore to God I would never, ever get back into a church. A uh, ladies evangelistic meeting may be okay. So I was invited to play the piano there, and I had no idea what the conference was going to be about, but it was prayer, the very thing that I had been angry about. And I think, oh dear, I've committed to three days. You know, I, there's no way to get out of this. But there was a lady who taught me the discipline of prayer who spoke about her discipline. She started with Psalms. She said, you may not have your ready prayers now or, or think you're, you're qualified to even pray appropriately to get answers, but start with Psalms, then read some Proverbs and journal, and that was it. For a year, Psalms, Proverbs, journal, Psalms, Proverbs, journal. And in those dots, those pages, I would go back and review and go, oh my, my prayers are being answered. And it did teach me the discipline of realizing that God is there every day. Amen. Thank you. Um, so getting back to prayer, how much time, let's see, how much time should we spend praying, talking, versus listening. And in addition to that, what you brought up was uh, psalms, you brought up journaling, you brought up um, proverbs. Sometimes we don't have words, so those can become our prayers. Sometimes I find writing prayers an easier way for me to express myself, just writing them out. So variety, changing it up maybe, um, yeah, but the prayer and the listening, the speaking and the listening. Go ahead, Brad. I think you were going to well, say something. I, I had a hard time when I was little reading that King James Version. That was very difficult to understand. Then they came out with the Living Bible. Remember that green Living Bible? And that yes. was much easier to read. Yes. And then somewhere along the way, I decided that maybe reading the Bible through, all the way through is a good idea. And so I tried reading different versions. So it came down to the point where every year I'd be looking and ordering a different version of the Bible and reading that Bible through. And that has been a wonderful thing in my life is to read the Bible through every year, but try different versions because you get different flavors. And, and, and instead of journaling, I keep a little three by five card right handy because all of a sudden one of these days you're gonna get a special verse. And, and I, I, my last special verse I'll share with you right now. It was uh, something I wouldn't have guessed, and it's out of the Old Testament in the Torah. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his mercy and grant you his peace. 
Well, that I thought was wonderful, and I wrote it down. Turns out that that's the Aaronic blessing, and that was one of the biggest things the Jews do all the time, that and the Shema. And that's another wonderful verse. So as you go through and read your Bible, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is an integral part of your, you know. Absolutely. You know, relationship with God is reading your Bible. And, and then when you read the Bible, I mean, on the prayer team, we get lots and lots. Your prayer requests are prayed for. I want you to know that. The prayer requests come in. They come in on our email. They take pictures of them. So all the prayer team prays on all those prayer requests. So we are big in intercessory prayer, too. And that's where I like that ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. And so that's a large part. And so when you do pray those prayers, you're, you're asking God for something, and you rarely hear the answers. I like to get the answers. So when people actually follow up and say, by the way, here's what happened, we really like that. So please, if you're going to do a prayer request also, tell us what happened because it's nice to know. Exactly. And um, just to segue on what you were saying, the blessings, there are so many blessings that God speaks to us through those blessings. And many of them are in the Torah. And uh, thank you so much for that. I just love that blessing too. Harvey, please. Yes, I want to go back a little bit because I'm still with those who may be having troubles. And I want to make a statement that I've learned. It is safe to be angry at God. Yes. God is the yes. only person on this planet, not on this planet, that we can communicate with. It is safe to be angry at because God will never retaliate. Amen. He Thank knows you're God. angry. Oh. So tell him, God, am I angry at you? And you may use coarser language than that. It does not turn God off. Second thing, a very, very close and dear, precious person to me was having trouble with drugs. And he joined a particular 12-step program, had a sponsor called Rudy. May his name be blessed. And he started with the first step. And the second step, there is someone, a power greater than you, who can bring you order and peace. And he said, now, just a minute, I don't believe in God. He said, that's not a problem. Believe in Rudy's God. Rudy's God made him clean and sober. And he will make you clean and sober. For those of you who are having trouble with God, believe in the God of someone who is walking with God, and that God will answer you. You don't have to get his name right. You can say it any language you want. It doesn't matter. Amen. God is waiting to hear from you. And when that, your phone rings his phone, he is thrilled, and he will respond. Oh, wow, thank you so much, Harvey. I did receive a signal. Um, and so I please make a comment. Rosie, I know you've got your mic up and you're ready to speak. And then when you're finished, would you kindly say a prayer for us for closure here? Yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of us. We've had the chance and opportunity to study and pray together and wrestle with some of these things. I guess what I'd like to do is echo your sentiments to Harvey and all of us, that we come authentically as we are, imperfect. God is someone that I too can be very angry with and he gets my authentic self, the colorful self, the one word that I wouldn't necessarily share with you all. But, and he gets it there live and it's safe. And time and time again, he's proven that he's trustworthy. Amen. And that comes from us just being able to say, God, I don't know what the next step is but be there, and I'm with you. Here I am, which is what we're talking about today. Um, just thank you so much, all of you, for participating in this with Together. It's been a, a real joy. Um, abiding, Jesus calls us to abide. John 15, over and over and over, the invitation to abide with him comes to us. I am so grateful for that. Amen. I cannot wait to fall at the feet of Jesus. Oh, me too. If there's anyone out there where you feel that answers are just not enough, there's Jesus. And we can completely, through the brokenness of our lives, imperfection of our lives, and some of us have been turned over, shook up, upside down, backwards and forwards, and we're imperfect. God is truly there, 
and it's these small little dots of just being with him on a daily basis, being in his word, where he starts to unfold these incredible miracles. I, amen. Amen. So sh I would love to invite everyone to pray at this time, and maybe sure. we can do something that we call popcorn prayer, where all of us can join in in prayer. What do you all think? right. That sounds fun. Yeah. All right. I'll okay. start, and Harvey, if you could close the, the session here. Let's bow our heads. Dear Con Hilly Father, thank you so much that you are so great, that you answer prayers in a way that's beyond our imagination, dear Lord. And I ask for patience with us when we think we are right and we know exactly what that prayer answer should look like, feel like, be like, that you know us better than we know ourselves. You know the plans you have made for our life and how everything connects so that in the end it is you that will be glorified and not anything we have done. Amen. And dear Lord, that is the true test of anything. Is God glorified in the end? And we want to be your humble hands and your feet. And please forgive us for our absolute shortcomings every day day, our inability to right wrongs perfectly, our inability to say the right things sometimes. But before we sit there, dear Lord, and think that we're completely unqualified, you know you put the Holy Spirit in front of us to qualify our mess so that it becomes your message. And we pray, dear Lord, today that you take us wherever we are in humility and work your good works for your glory. Amen. Amen. Father, you seem to be so thrilled to hear us pray to you, so thrilled to answer prayers in a way that shows your love and documents your wisdom. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone with, who hears my voice who doesn't know your joy in answering their prayer, they will give you a chance. Yes. Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for these prayer conferences and the fact that we can come together and we can learn something that's going to help improve our relationship with you. We ask that you will send your Holy Spirit so that he will impress our hearts with that little piece that we need to hear. We may not want to hear it, but Lord, you want us to hear it. So please help us to be listening to that still small voice. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, that you call us through your Son, Jesus, to abide with you. We have been called. That's how you call us. And we gladly follow on this up and down journey. And uh, thank you that you are with us in the valleys and the peaks. Go with us throughout the remainder of this Sabbath and the remainder of the conference, Lord. Amen. 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 We're, looks like we have three more minutes on the clock, or I'm not sure, but we certainly are happy that you've joined us. I know, Becky, do you have the prayer line number for those of uh, the it's audience? Actually, absolutely, to... and in the program, um, there is a page that has some of the different prayer options that are available, and actually that number is in the program. The 7 a.m., and it's in the church bulletin as well. We would love to have you join us um, on the 7 a.m. prayer line. Also, we have a prayer room, room number 102, and it's on the south end of our campus that you inquire about for those of you who want to just go and quietly and pray and feel the need uh, to just step out, maybe be in between some of the services. Um, so uh, always uh, check and there's always an answer to your prayers or someone who can pray with you. And there's always people there, right, Rosie? Yes. There's always people. There. This is a church that has people that are praying for you constantly. And thank you so much. This is why we have lay leaders leading and teaching us because they actually finish not on time, they finish early. You get a bunch of preachers out there, we'd be here till noon. So can you join me in giving a hand to our wonderful panelists?
Thank you so much for reminding us that our journey here is about trying to bring people closer to a God that is present, even if that God isn't always our God, as Harvey shared. Friends, thank you so much. We have a bunch of more activities for you. If you've come to first service, you can go have lunch. We'll see you at four. If you're waiting for second service, make yourself comfortable. We've got a great program. If you're cold, sorry, I can't do anything about the temperature in here. Go outside and warm yourselves up with the sun. Have a great rest of the prayer conference, and may God continue to bless you. Welcome to this special Mother's Day edition of Week in Review right here on the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Sheila Hodgkins is off on assignment, but Ganim and I are here to uh, give you the update of what's been going on behind the scenes of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network this week. Uh, we have the verses of the day that is uh, coming up, but uh, let me introduce to you today's sponsor of the live broadcast of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network here in Sabbath. Uh, thanks to the Knight family from Oklahoma, also the Nuremberdorfs from California, and from Florida, the Clayton Patrick family, and of course, uh, the Masseys there in Florida. So thank you so much for your support. And these are just a few of the names that uh, uh, contribute to the LLBN uh, daily support. But these are special. Why? Well, because they're part of the live broadcast. Now, one would say, how do I become part of the live broadcast announcement? It's really more of a rotational uh, process. We try to give everyone the opportunity to have their name uh, service on spo uh, Sabbath sponsorship live. That's our peak time for viewership from Friday night through Saturday night. So uh, we just like to take the opportunity during the live hours to make this announcement. But right now it's time for the verse of the day, uh, or shall we say verses, get them? Yes, mm -hmm. verses. Well, you know, with Mother's Day being a great occasion for all of us, one here comes from Exodus, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. Well, you know, um, we all need to honor our mothers, whether we're men or women. Honoring our mother and father is very critical. And uh, this is Mother's Day weekend, and, and our mothers deserve special love and attention and recognition, which we should be doing all the time, Marlon, all the, all the time. But uh, it's a great day to reset our, uh, our, our, our compass to say, remember your mother. Mm, public recognition. Yes, sir. There's another one from uh, Proverbs 1, 8, 9. It says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. How important that is. And, 
and so truthful because I grew up in a home. Uh, my mom was pretty much the teacher of life for me. Uh, she set a perfect example. She laid the instruction. She made it clear that all came in combination with great love. Uh, so uh, mother teaching is very, very important. And thank you moms for mm -hmm. taking time out of your life and devoting your life to teach your children. And fortunately, some of that is disappearing in some areas of the world and cities. Uh, but through God's grace, we still have wonderful and faithful <clears throat> mothers out there who does provide good foundation for their children. Well, the Bible tells us that um, we are to live Jesus Christ all day long. Uh, we're supposed to wake up with uh, thoughts of him to tell our children, and not only our children, but our spouse and our brothers and sisters and uh, our right. mothers. And, and that instruction is so pivotal because the early years are the formation years. Yeah. The Bible ta talks about training up a child in, in the way of the Lord, and yes. if he departs, he, sh he will return. That's my story, as a matter of fact, mm. uh, and that's your story as well. Mm. What else do you have for about mothers? Well, again, I'm, 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 I'm using verses here just to identify love, and I associate love with faithful mothers who love their children. Uh, John 15, 12 says this, is my commandment, this is from Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. And this is where a mother comes to mind because most mothers that I've known in my lifetime, they have made huge sacrifices for their children and they have loved, they have loved their ch children dearly. And uh, so this verse just kind of reminds me of the love God has given to humanity. Um, in John 15, 13, it says, greater Love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So it's just wonderful, God's love. Jesus speaks of love. He gives a commandment of love. God speaks of love. And the greatest source of love that we all experience come from mothers. So we love you and we respect you. All mothers out there, LLBN, salute you for the wonderful job you have done for your family. Uh, you do your best, and of course, the rest in the hands of the Lord, uh, how the children will grow mm. and how they become to be. But thank you. Thank you for being in our lives. Thank you for nurturing us. Thank you for not only loving your children, but loving, supporting your ministries and your local churches and so many other organizations throughout our communities. Mm. Well, I'm uh, pretty lucky because uh, my mom lives in Loma Linda. So happy Mother's Day tomorrow, Mom. Uh, thanks for watching LLBN. <laughs> thanks for your support as well. Yeah. Well, well, my mother has passed, so uh, yeah. I look forward for the day mm -hmm. when the Lord will reunite us in his kingdom. And you said your mother is, is passed, but I got some great news for you. Okay. The prayers of your mother are still being heard. The prayers that she offered for you and your siblings... God still That's right. hears them according to That's the right. spirit of prophecy. That's right. I mean, it makes sense. You know, what's recorded in the books of heaven, prayer request, uh, it doesn't, those chapters don't close. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's how I see God. God is, is of just and God does not forget and God that keeps going. So uh, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that with me and our viewers. Well, let's talk about uh, the Christian Connections. Uh, last week, we had a, a really special uh, edition. Uh, we had the uh, president of the Middle East and North Africa Union Mission uh, spend the hour with us. His name is uh, Rick McEdward. And uh, the guy is really a, a dynamic. I was fortunate to meet him with you uh, on, yeah. on the last edition of uh, Christian Connections. Yeah. We found a lot in common, Marlon, but one in particular common grounds we found that we have the Arabic, uh, uh, LLB and Arabic channel that broadcasts in Arabic throughout the world and the Middle East. And there was a connection there on that since he does represent that region. So we're uh, looking forward to big things from uh, the conference here um, in the uh, North Africa Union mission. Uh, Alexander Archer, very good singer, provide the music for last Tuesday's Christian Connection along with the service uh, from Rick McEdward. Uh, you can see it 
this evening and uh, tomorrow and once more on Tuesday before we do the live edition uh, in the evening at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, then we'll be fe featuring next Tuesday, uh, Walt Nelson. I'm sure many of you know him. He's been uh, in the ministry for decades. Um, he's going to uh, be talking about love. <laughs> we all need more love in this world. That's what Jesus is all about. Uh, music from Seventh Day Strings. They've been here before, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, that uh, on the next edition of Christian Connections. Well, Friday Night Live is uh, coming up uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, let's see, Robert Edwards, out of the box. You know who Robert Edwards is? He's a fine presenter. Elder Robert uh, Edwards, out of the box, with the music by uh, Paulette Jumalon and um, Joshua T, uh, as usual. So don't miss it. Uh, really great message. Well, Gadam, let's uh, talk about the special outreach that we have going on. Yes, Marlon, today I'd like to highlight a program that I think most of our viewers may not know that it exists. It's called LLBN Sermons, where we edit out all the fantastic sermons being given here on LLBN and package into series that plays throughout the week, highlighting those sermons. So you will likely to catch not only your favorite pastor, but you will discover many that you may have not listened to. So check out the times on the screen, and, and I think you'll find out when you tune into those series, you will be extremely blessed by the Word of God through the teaching of these individual ministers. And after you uh, have the Word to uplift you, uh, you can also go uh, to the app, the music app that you have put on, on the Facebook. On our page website, here, yes. People still asking a lot about that, Marlon. Mm -hmm. And I use it personally. It's a fantastic app. Uh, you, you just go to our website, uh, turn your computer on, type in LLBN.TV. It's on the home page right below the player. You click on it and you can listen to the most beautiful, beautiful classic hymnal music. Uh, some just music and others with vocals. It's very uplifting mm. and it's our gift to you and it's part of you givers gift to the rest of the world. Well, coming up uh, just in a couple of weeks, uh, May, May 31st, LLBN's new edition uh, dedication that uh, you don't want to miss. Now, again, I'm, I've uh, have not seen the construction workers around uh, the building in, in the last couple of weeks. What's going on? Is that a complaint or, or a compliment? Well, uh, are we able to pay them? That's <laughs> <laughs> yes, Marlon, you're absolutely right. You have not seen construction <laughs> workers, neither have I, because we are done with the construction. Mm -hmm. uh, the technology implementation phase is now and here, and that's a very complicated process. To get it all right, it'll probably take us to the end of the year. So we decided to fire up the place, to get it ready with some basic features, and come to you live to unveil the facility to you on May 31st. So mark your calendar, May 31st, 6 p.m. Uh, you'll see uh, a special on unveiling. There'll be special devotionals, prayers, dedication. Uh, it's a day of joy for us to honor God and honor his supporters who helped us build uh, this ministry. So uh, I'm really excited mm. and I can't believe I lived long enough to see <laughs> that day. And that was part of my daily prayers, Marlon, because this building came with a lot of hard work and sacrifices. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, for letting me see in my mind, the promised land for this ministry uh, uh, in May on May 31st. Amazing to see what this property has been uh, turning into. Um, this is uh, I'm sitting in a building that uh, was just a steel shed. In fact, it's still up there. Yeah, we yeah. just built over it. Yeah, around it, inside yeah. and out. Yeah, uh, and you know, to have this new addition yeah. uh, for storage, that would be yeah. it's, it's really amazing. You know what's most amazing mm -hmm. when I st stand out there or sit there. And look up, that used to be the sky above. Yeah. <laughs> and it was dirt underneath us. Yeah. And now it's a place 
of worship mm -hmm. for our Father and Creator where we can honor Him with better and greater mm -hmm. and more exciting programs. Mm -hmm. Well, Gannam, I just well, do see, we say uh, hallelujah to that? Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. But I also know it's that, hey, we're past time here. Uh-oh, okay. Uh, here's a, a letter for you uh, to uh, close the program. Uh, it's from Jonathan in Indian, Indiana, and he writes, I'm sending my donation to support LLBN Arabic and its programming to this region of the world. May God give you courage and strength as you work for him to reach souls in the Middle East. Roberta. Roberta from Oklahoma says, uh, I like the health-related programs on SLS and the weekly Sabbath services from the University Church. I want to thank all of you for your hard work and dedication. Uh, again, Roberta and Jonathan, uh, would you like to have, say a special prayer? Father Jesus, who walked on the water, who performed miracles, who uh, created us, thank you for having so much people who loves your work and love your ministry and come together in unity to serve you. Bless both Jonathan and Roberta, Father, and, 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 and just be with him. Be with him and continue to let him be a blessing to the rest of the world through their support and their offering to this ministry. In your precious name we ask this. Amen. And now we continue live with the programming uh, from LLBN. University Church is up next. See you next time on uh, Week in Review.
it's announcement time and we've got a lot going on, but we've had a lot going on all the way since last Sabbath afternoon. Kind of some leadership meetings. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, last Sabbath, we had all of our leaders for the new term, which starts in July. So they're not fully active yet, right. unless they're continuing on. And we had a luncheon and some meetings with them, just casting vision. We and have, then we had some training midweek. Yes. Because we're basically we trying to transition the church from just, uh, uh, well, basically to a more participatory, right? Yes. And we want to say, though, a huge thank you to all of those who have been Absolutely. serving and who are currently serving until July. Uh, they man, kind of served an extra year or two COVID. because of COVID. So yeah. an extra Rinsetted. thank you, shout out to all of those that have been such solid leaders for years in this church. And we're going to be doing something special for them as well. Yeah. Now, during we want to make point out that during the services today, we're going to be first service. We're doing a commissioning and ordination of elders. And we're doing the same the deacons. This is all part of uh, a vision, a discipleship focused vision. And you're going to be hearing more of that throughout the year. So I'm uh, excited. Yeah. Now, one of the things that with all this leadership training that we've just started, it's just brand new. All of this doesn't work unless there's prayer. And that's why we've connected it. Now we've been already started Thursday evening. We started our prayer conference and we continue that today, including this afternoon it concludes, it's at four o'clock in the sanctuary um, and you're not gonna wanna miss it. Even if you've missed the others, it'll be a very meaningful service. Uh, Pastor Randy is gonna be sharing in that. There'll be opportunities for prayer. And also at the end, if someone wants it after the service, there'll be an opportunity for anointing as well. We love our kids here at the University Church and our children's department under Pastor Shauna Campbell have been doing a magnificent job with our kids. All the leaders, everyone, just thank you. A shout out to all the leaders and uh, the children's department. But here is a video of our kids letting you know what's happening for VBS this summer. Wait a minute, what's this all about? It's going to be Vacation Bible School. I think it's from June 12 to 16. It's going to be at night at 6.30 to 8 o'clock. It's going to be fun. It's going to be so cool. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. The kids did a really great job on that, didn't they? They're so cute. Yeah. <laughs> well, our next announcement, our annual memorial service is coming up. Here's Pastor Adrian to tell us more. Happy Sabbath, friends. Losing a loved one is probably the most difficult experience anyone could have. The one thing that makes the burden a little lighter is being surrounded by family and friends who offer their love and consolation during this difficult time. Here at the Loma Linda University Church, we reach out to our bereaved families at the time of their grief. And once a year, we celebrate the lives of those who have passed on. Two weeks from today, on May 21st, we will have our annual memorial service. Our theme this year is Forever in Our Hearts. This service promises to bring comfort, support, and encouragement to those of you who have lost a precious loved one during this past year or at any time in your life. Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our music department is having their annual spring concert next Sabbath, May 14 at five o'clock in the sanctuary. This concert is entitled, And Grace Will Lead Me Home. We have our full choir, orchestra, wonderful musicians. So come out and join us at five o'clock next Sabbath, May the 14th. Well, that's our announcements for today. And as we always say, for more information or the latest information, go to our website, louc.org. And if you are visiting with us, we really would love for you to come out to the Uconnect Center. Let us know you're here, where you're from. We can answer any questions. We just want to meet you and welcome here to our church. And for all of you at home and in the sanctuary watching, we love you guys. Have a terrific Sabbath day.
Amen, for sure. Thank you, Kimo. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to worship here at Loma Linda University Church. A beautiful sunny day. A May Southern California Sabbath. We're delighted to have you here. Welcome to worship. We welcome those joining us on the broadcast, viewing by LLBN or any of the other platforms. And we want to say thank you. Thank you to our moms, and happy Mother's Day to our moms. This is not my mom. This is the mom of my children. <laughs> but we want to say a happy Mother's Day Sabbath to each and every one of you who are mothers. We're delighted that you have joined us here for this worship service on a very special weekend. This weekend is our prayer conference weekend, our annual prayer conference. As a discipleship-focused church, we recognize that prayer is integral to the discipleship journey. So, Anita, thank you to you and to your team who have planned this weekend. Tell us a little bit about what's happening. Thank you. Indeed, it is a team effort, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So we have been working with discipleship and with the pastoral staff team to choose the specific theme for this year. Right. Here am I, Lord, send me. So it comes at the end of a whole year almost of, of, of looking towards that goal of training and knowing how to respond to God, how to listen and how to know uh, his voice. And it's been a wonderful um, journey. And so we come to this weekend. And I hope that you are blessed if you have been attending with us already. You probably have a copy of our printed booklet that has information about the whole entire weekend. If you don't and you have the regular bulletin, you can see that there is a QR code. It should show on our screen pretty soon here. You can just um, uh, download the program, the entire booklet, just by, by using the QR code. It has a lot of wonderful information about the whole time, the, the speakers, the schedule, and uh, other prayer-related information. I will say that, as Anita mentioned, we have been moving in this direction throughout the year with all of our planning, with our drawing of lay people deeper into service, uh, with sermon series that have been focusing on mentoring for ministry, and then especially this weekend. Our speakers have all been speakers who've been drawn from our church membership, who have been lay people in our membership, and they've been outstanding. Thursday night, Nicole Schwelt a, what is she, a junior at the junior at at Loma Linda Academy, mm -hmm. preached an exceptional sermon. If you missed it, you need to go back and watch it. And last Amen. night, Kelly Lynn from our young adult ministry, the same. And today, Carissa Vitorovich. I had the honor and the privilege of teaching a class in preaching that Carissa took. And by the time she finished her sermon, I said, you don't need this class. I need to learn from you. And uh, just deeply blessed by what she said already this morning. We're looking forward to it again, third service. So it's been a wonderful weekend, Anita. That's right. So we have many opportunities um, to participate. If you haven't been with us throughout the week, um, I hope that you today had the opportunity to stop by our lobby and look at the different prayer tables, stations, opportunities. We, I would invite you just to do that. We have a prayer wall where you can write down your prayer request. Uh, we also have a, a feature specific needs for prayer, such as our You Reach program, uh, the homeless uh, ministry. They, uh, they, they do many, many, many things, but we, right now we have a, uh, a screen there that is showing pictures of their ministry, and I know they would want your help and your support. Uh, we have one that is specifically invites you to join in praying for the victims of human trafficking. And if you don't know, San Bernardino County is one of the worst in our nation. Painful to even imagine that. And then we have one uh, dedicated to praying for refugees. You can partner specifically with families that need prayer. So we're very grateful for that. I have to tell you that one of the ways that I have been deeply uh, blessed already is with our praise team. And the theme song that has been written specifically for that. I wanna say thank you to each of you. And this morning, of course, the choir song that here I am, Lord, thank Absolutely. you so much. Yes. It's been a wonderful morning. We look forward to a wonderful service. I would add to it that this afternoon, we hope you'll come back. It will be a special time of commissioning for ministry, and we will also have at the end of the program, as we've had for a number of years now, an, an anointing service. And it could be that that's something that the Lord has laid on your heart, anointing for something in your life and experience. 
for which you're praying for healing. We'd be honored to have you here as a part of that. So we just want to welcome you to this, not only this worship service, but to this prayer conference weekend. Whenever I think about prayer, my heart is just pulled back magnetically to that passage in 2 Chronicles 7, where God, speaking through the prophet, says, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and hear my voice and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So God bless you as we worship and as we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand as we sing, Here Am I, Lord. beautiful. Right now we have an opportunity for our garden of prayer. It's one of the special times that we have in our worship service where I know each one of you carries something in your heart, maybe in your mind, a prayer request. Maybe it's for someone in your life. Maybe it's someone that you work with, a neighbor, Maybe it's a son, a daughter, a parent. Maybe it's something that is on your heart for you. Maybe you're going through something right now and you would like a special prayer for that situation. So I just want to invite you, if you would like to, to come up here with me. Just join me right, join me right down here in front and we would just like to have a special prayer specifically for you or for the person that you are coming down for, the person that you're thinking about in your, in your mind. So if you would like to come forward, um, I'm going to join you down, and we're just going to have a special prayer. Life is tough sometimes. 
each one of us has something or someone we would like to pray for. And if you don't want to come down, God knows who you have in your heart and he knows what situation you're going through. So as we join together in prayer, we invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes and still come. If I start praying and you're en route, come on down um, as we're praying. Father God, we sure do love and adore you. We know that we would be absolutely lost without you. And it is our privilege to come together as a church family to worship together and sing your praises. Lord, you see us through every situation. Oftentimes, Lord, we don't understand what you're doing in our lives. We don't understand how you have answered our prayers. But Lord, we trust you regardless of what situation we find ourselves in right now. Lord, we claim your promises in scripture that you will always be with us, that you care about our needs, that where two or more are gathered together, you are there. And Lord, we want to bring every prayer request to you right now, specifically all of those who came down front, those in the pews, those at home. Lord, there are situations that are in dire need of word from you. There are families that need to be healed. There are people that are suffering from sickness and disease, Lord. They need to sense your presence. They need to feel your touch in their life, and they need your healing. Father, we pray in your name that you would answer every prayer request that is before you right at this moment. Lord, we don't know how, we don't know your timing, but we trust that you have our best interest in mind and that you will answer because, Lord, your vantage point that you can see far exceeds ours. So since we are mere humans who do not know the whole situation, we surrender it to you, Lord. Have your way. Father, we want to lift up all the mothers. We want to lift up all of those who want to be mothers. We want to lift up all of those who are missing their mothers or who have broken relationships with their mothers. Lord, you know those situations, but we just want to thank you for the gift of motherhood and for the gift of our mothers in our lives. And Lord, if there is something, some relationship with our mothers that needs healing, I pray a special prayer of blessing in that situation. So go with us the rest of today. Be with us with our worship service. Be with Carissa as she brings us our message. Lord, open our hearts to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, in all the synoptic gospels, there's a story that appears time and time again. Luke tells us about it in the 18th chapter of his manuscript. It's a story of a, a young man who comes to Christ and asks him, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
I don't know if you've ever asked that question, but if you have, the answer to it is quite evident. Someone needs to die in order for you to claim your inheritance. And so the question that this young man asks betrays a sense of lack of understanding. And we do that a lot in our spiritual walk, don't we? You know, we come to church, we pray our prayers, we read our Bible, we listen to moving and compelling messages and worship with wondrous music because we're trying to make ourselves acceptable before God. And so I can just picture Jesus sighing and saying, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything to inherit eternal life. Eternal life already belongs to you. In me, eternal life is your inheritance, your birthright. And so the question really isn't, what do we need to do? Rather, the question is, how might we respond? And this is one of my favorite parts of the service, because we get to respond. We get to partner with you in ministry. I love working in this church because we see ministry in all the different facets it affords. From crib to casket, we journey with you. And if you have been blessed by the ministries of this church, we would humbly request that you partner with us through your tithes and offerings. You know, I was during first service being blessed by Carissa's message, and I looked at Carissa, and I looked at Randy, and Randy was sweating bullets. Because if the student doesn't deliver, you blame the teacher. And today, as we as students of the great teacher think about what is to come next, as we invest ourselves in the enterprise of kingdom building, might we be bold? Won't we give wholeheartedly? Won't we partner in, with him? Won't we respond to the gift that is eternal life? So it's not teacher, what do we need to do in order to inherit? It's master, what would you have me do today in order for others to learn about your scandalous grace? May God bless you as you give.
Good morning, church. Today we have Ellie Parker with us, and she is here to give her life to Christ in baptism. Give her a wave, say hello. <laughs> this is a wonderful moment, this truly is. The first time I had the privilege of meeting Ellie, she came to the high school youth room there with her friends, uh, Carolyn and Ava. And at the end of the service, she, she just promptly said, listen, what do you need to happen to, to pack and clean up? And just the heart of service and just her willingness to acknowledge that somebody needed to do something and her just joy at stepping into that it was fantastic. We said, well, listen, we, we need to clean the floors and, and do the dishes. And she just got stuck into it. And one of the very first things that she said to me, she said, listen, Chris, you know what, I don't like doing the dishes much at home, but it's really good here. <laughs> week after week, Ellie would just come and whatever needed to be done, she just stepped in. It was fantastic at the end of a service. She'd say, Chris, where's the vacuum cleaner? The floors need cleaning. She has a heart of service and she loves to participate in her community. So after a while, she said, listen, Chris, I'd like to get baptised. And so we started studies together, and we've been studying together for months, and it's been a joy, it really has. It's been just a joy to go through the scriptures and just to talk about the beliefs of the church and, and what a life of love lived in Christ means. Ellie uh, chose this weekend, uh, specifically because her grandma is traveling. And if we can just get her family and, and friends to stand up so we can recognize them quickly, just so we can say hello, and there they are, hello. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I love it. Because her grandma was traveling down from Washington and wanted her grandma, who has been incredibly important in her faith journey, to be here on this special day. So church, we are very fortunate to have Ellie joining us. We will be blessed as a congregation because of the gifts that she brings to us as she lives her life of faith. So Ellie... Because you accept God as the author, as the reason, as the one in whom you live and exist and have your being. Because you accept that the Spirit guides you and gifts you. Because you accept the grace of Jesus our Saviour. I now have the privilege and the pleasure of baptising you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I always say this, church, listen, no one regrets a baptism. If you are thinking of baptism, please have a chat to Ellie afterwards and ask her about her experience. Baptism is a beautiful symbol in your journey of faith. Thank you so much for considering these things and enjoy yourselves as the service continues. This is a special moment that doesn't happen very often. And that is, as we're coming out of what we now call the DLT, Discipleship Leadership Team, formerly known as the Nominating Committee, we are this weekend beginning to roll out our new leadership team and commission and ordain them for ministry. So I'm joined here on the platform by two very special people. You may not know that you depend on a lot of things in the worship service to these two people and to their team, but you do, and we all do. This is Rod Roth and Dick Sample. So Rod Roth is currently our head deacon and will be through next year, and then Dick will be taking over from 2023 to 2025. I told Rod earlier that I was going to say that he's been our head deacon since 1980. <laughs> He's been a faithful servant, and we profoundly appreciate that. But we're doing something very special here today. Talk to us about what we're doing. Yes, thank you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Today we're focused on the deacon leadership, and you may ask yourselves, what are they leading or who are they leading? Um, if you look at the Bible, the Bible tells you that a deacon is somebody who is worthy of respect, sincere, uh, somebody who does not indulge in uh, dishonesty or 
too much Martinelli. Uh, that may be a paraphrase, I'm not sure. But what the Bible describes is who a deacon is. It does not specify what a deacon does. If you look in our own con congregation here, you see that a deacon may be a student. It may be uh, somebody who's unemployed. It may be somebody who's professional or retired, a laborer. A deacon is any one of us who shares two things. One is the love of our Lord, and one is a desire to serve. And so whether it is one of the nearly 60 people that it takes to collect an offering in this sanctuary every Sabbath morning, or whether it's somebody who helps prepare communion emblems or the trays, helps set up the foot washing, help with baptisms and any of the other uh, special assignments that we have, a deacon is somebody who has really echoed the theme of our prayer conference this time, which is, here my Lord sent me. Amen. That is so true, Rod. And I say of deacons kind of what I say of our media crew and probably quite a few other of those who serve us here at the church, and that is they never have an, <clears throat> pardon me, an upfront platform like you, Rod, and Dick do today, but they are faithful in their service, and we're profoundly grateful for them. So I'd like to invite our deacon leaders to come up. I'm not sure from where everybody will be coming, but invite them to come up this morning. So let me tell you what we're doing. We have many, many more deacons than what are coming up. We will be having an ordination service for other deacons a little bit further down the road. This morning, our focus is twofold. First of all, principally, it's on these deacon leaders that are behind us. Interestingly enough, each one of which has already been ordained at some point in their life and ministry. So just so you're aware of how it works in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the Adventist Church, if you have been ordained anywhere along the path, in any Adventist Church as a deacon, you are not reordained. And so for the ones who are gathering here behind us on both sides, we are offering a prayer of consecration this morning. But there is one. I'm going to ask you to step down here, Emily. Emily is one of our faithful deacons, our shuttle cart drivers, our volunteers for Rooted, for hospitality ministry. In other words, Emily's been very involved in many facets of our church. When we did our last deacon ordination through a, an error on our part, we missed ordaining Emily. And Emily is, because her husband has mastered the fellowship elsewhere, is going to be leaving us. And so we're going to ordain you this morning, Emily, and that's a privilege before you go. So we're very thankful for each person who is here gathered. We want to say a prayer of consecration and of ordination for each of you. Oh, yes, Rod, please. If we could have any of the currently serving deacons, wherever you are, just stand in your place, let people see how many of us are among. And if you would remain standing during the prayer, we would much appreciate that. Would you pray with me? God of grace, all the way back 2,000 years ago in the early church, in the book of Acts, they, led by the Spirit, said we need to lay hands on some of these individuals who are people of the Word, people of the way, and people of service. Lord, from that point on, deacons have always served us as congregations who follow Jesus. We express our profound gratitude to each one who serves, and we thank you for placing your call on their lives. Lord, these deacon leaders that stand behind me, we pray that the power of your Spirit would rest upon them, that you would consecrate them to this ministry. To those who have stood who are already in service, continue to bless them as they serve. We pray that in these coming years they might find deeper walk with Jesus and a wider reach for their ministry. And then for Emily, I pray that you would Bless her and guide her as we ordain her to this work of deacon, whether it be here or wherever she goes. Might your spirit walk with her, with her husband, each and every day. Lord, for all of these things, we praise you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, each and every one. We're thankful for every single one of you.
mom called me. She said, hey, you need to pray because your grandpa is in the hospital right now. He knew like I was a Christian since I was little, but I can never picture that he will pray with me together or say, oh yeah, I'm interested in your God. I just can never picture that. I don't know if I finish the college and go back, will I still be able to see him? What if my grandpa pass away and I'll miss the chance like forever? So I was thinking if I can go back even for two weeks, I want to introduce Jesus to him. You know, I first came, I was a student, I don't have a job. The price of the ticket is super expensive, like around like 2000 something the round trip. So I was like, oh, there's no way I can go back. I just start to pray. I say, God, would you please do something? I know you could, but why it seems like you're not answering my prayer? I was in the choir. So I think after three days, that was the last concert. Before the concert started, and we were standing on the stage, we were introducing ourselves. So anyways, the concert finished, and then just all of a sudden, there's a lady just come to me. She said, hi, your name is Angel, right? I said, oh, hi, just in, you know, like being polite. And she said, you say you're from China? Uh, so are you going back this Christmas? I was like, uh, maybe. <laughs> I kind of like, you know, just be quick and then don't want to share any details. And she just said, maybe. What stop you from going back? I said, oh, you know, it's really far and then the ticket is really expensive. And so I don't know. So she just said, um, so tell me what are you going to do if you're going back? I just felt like it was quite interesting, you know, like no one really come to you and directly ask those questions. Mm -hmm. So I just like, okay, maybe I can share a little bit. I just told her, oh yeah, I would definitely go back to visit my family because my grandpa's sick and then I want to go back to see him. I just felt like I have a burden. I need to let him know God. And then all of a sudden this lady just said, let's do a prayer. Let's pray together, see how God can lead you. And in her prayer, she just mentioned one sentence that caught my attention. She just said, God, tell me how can I help her? How, how can I help her? And I was like, I didn't expect her to help me in any ways. And then I don't know why she said that. So after the prayer, there's someone just bring the Christmas gift to her. And she said, this is quite early, I think. This is really God telling me what to do. And she asked me, how much is the ticket for you to go back? So I told her it's around like 2000, it's quite expensive. And she said, give me your folder. And she just put an envelope in there. And then she wrote another check. And then she passed it back to me. She just said, open it. In the folder, there's a whole bunch of cash. So add up together, it's just like, I think it's 2000 something exactly for me to go home. So immediately I just started to cry. My tears just coming down. I was like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. And she say, well, you don't need to say anything because this is not my money. This is the money God prepared. And then God just showing me that you're the one needing this. Eventually I booked the ticket and then I find a long time with my grandpa and just, I just start to share with him. I said, Grandpa, do you know how did I get back? My grandpa said, how did you come back? I said, I pray to God. I say, God, I need to see my grandpa. And there's a stranger lady. She just prepared this money for me to come back to see you. He, he, he become like, he becomes silent for, for, a, for a second. He just look at me. I say, Really? I said, yes. And then the Holy Spirit just kind of touched me. So I say, Grandpa, do you believe there's God? And he just said, yes. <laughs> and I said, do you believe that he loves you? He just nodded his head. I was like, there's no way. My grandpa, I can never picture him being a Christian, you know? It's really God. So uh, during that three months, sometimes I just see him like cross his finger and laying, laying down there. It seems like he's doing a prayer. And then by the end of three months, I know I can leave like peacefully. So I left end of December and I came back at March 
and in May, my mom called me. My grandpa passed away. I know I've done my job. I know God sent me back as a special、um, plans for my grandpa. Yeah, which I can never picture or imagine. Family, our scripture this afternoon is taken from Isaiah chapter six, verses one through eight. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, "Holy, holy, holy!" Is the Lord Almighty? The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me! I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, "See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for." Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" And I said, "Here am I. Send me." By all accounts, Michael May has lived an extraordinary life. As an Olympic athlete, he won three bronze medals in various alpine skiing events. Michael then went on to become a CIA employee, before later becoming a very successful inventor. All of these incredible accomplishments become even more amazing when you learn that Michael Mays was fully blind. At the age of three, due to a chemical explosion, Michael lost his sight. And yet, even with this challenge, he still achieved many and significant dreams. Except. Perhaps, for one, Michael had never looked on the face of his beloved wife. He never seen the childish joy across the faces of his two little boys. In 1999, a revolutionary procedure was developed, and it offered Michael the promise of sight. Restored, but this procedure did not come without its risks, both its physical risks, but also its emotional risks, on him, and on his family. Michael recalls the day as he sat there on the bed, and his bandages were removed. He vividly recalls looking at the eyes. Of his little boys, shocked and amazed at the brilliant blue that he saw revealed there. As you can imagine, Michael Mays never forgot that first glimpse, though it came with great risks. He was willing. To pursue, in order to see the light. How far would you go to see the light? Heavenly Father, today we come to you as believers seeking your face, 
God, we feel so incredibly blessed to be able to gather together and to come before your throne of grace knowing that you are our God, our King, our Savior, and our Lord. And so, Father, here we are before you. And I pray, Father, that you and you alone may speak and be lifted up. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. It was a time of great stress and of political intrigue. War was on the horizon, or at least the very real threat, that it may soon be a reality. And no, I'm not speaking of our current age, but rather thousands of years ago, as recorded in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1 reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. It was not uncommon to record the year based upon when the king died or when he ascended to the throne. This was common practice. And yet, what is uncommon, or maybe remarkable here, is the stress that this statement would have induced for individuals living in these times. You see, when a king died, the nation went through a time of incredible vulnerability, instability, fear. And insecurity that the, the nation was at its weakest point and especially as is the case for King Uzziah's kingdom for you see for many years now the kingdom of Judah had been attacked by the ruthless Assyrians King Uzziah was a fearless defender, always on the forefront of the attack. With him in command, the people felt secure and safe. But now, he was dead. You can imagine the chatter in the marketplace as the townspeople turn to one, each other, one another and say, what's going to happen? Will we be okay? Will we survive? Will the Assyrians overtake us? And it's as though in Isaiah chapter 6, the camera that was zoomed in upon the scene of the death of the king now pans up to another king seated on his throne to the only king that would not die, to the only king whose reign was secure, to the only God who would last forever. And Isaiah sees this incredible picture of God and the hope that it offered to him. The experience of Isaiah was not in common. In fact, it mirrors those of any, many other great leaders of faith, including Moses, Amos, Daniel, Ezekiel, and John on the lonely isle of Patmos, who all saw the Lord revealed in his glory. As the SDA Bible commentary expounds, when perils encompass God's people, and the powers of darkness seem about to prevail. God calls them to look up to him, seated on his throne and directing in the affairs of heaven and earth in order that they may take courage and hope. Does our world need hope and courage today? Do we need hope and courage today. As our eyes 
scan the horizon and we see the chaos, we feel the fear. And today God is saying, like Isaiah, to pan that camera off to the one who sits on the throne. In times of great crisis and every day in between, the people of God can look up from the weakness of humankind to the king who reigns forever. Have your eyes looked up? Have you too seen the light? After seeing this glory of God revealed, Isaiah naturally then begins to say, Woe is me, for I am undone. Woe is me, for I am undone. I remember a time in my recent past where I also said those words, though for a very different context than you may be imagining. There I stood in front of a full-length mirror in the beautiful country of India, a place of incredible spices and aromas and bright, vivid colors, and I was looking at a sari that had just been gifted to me. A beautiful sari that I could not wait to wear to church that evening to surprise the one who had bestowed it upon me. So I did what anyone my age would do. I, I got on YouTube, right? <laughs> or TikTok, didn't exist then. I get on and, and I begin to search, how do you put on a sari? As you can imagine, the videos made it look quite simple. But I was deceived. I began to wrap the sari and put the pleats, and just as I thought I should, and I admittedly was rather proud of my work, it was not as hard as I feared. And I was already imagining the joyous expressions as I showed up to church and met those who had given this sari to me. I began to hurry downstairs and out to the street to my mode of transportation for that evening, a motorcycle, <laughs> on which I was to ride side saddle in my sari. Don't tell my mother. <laughs> but something happened as I began to cross that street, something I have not forgotten. That sari began to unravel. My beautiful pleats were now falling down at my ankles. <laughs> and in horror, I'm grabbing the fabric and trying to put it in all the necessary places. In distraught terror, I looked at the house across the way, a house that had two little girls with whom I had played soccer earlier in that day. And they returned that same expression of fear. <laughs> shock and terror. They quickly ushered me in their home, and their mother opened the door, and with one glance of horror, she set about fixing this dire situation. Within five minutes flat, I had already eaten a delicious meal that she somehow quickly prepared as she wrapped me back up appropriately in the sari with at least a couple dozen safety pens to ensure it stayed. And there, of course, I said, Woe is me, for I was undone. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think of this story as I studied through the life of Isaiah. How often in our own lives do we try to wrap ourselves beautifully? <laughs> to put those clothes just right, those happy Sabbath, good to see you. The image for all others to see. And yet our best attempts often unravel, and sometimes at the most inopportune of times. 
here before the presence of God and his glory. Isaiah firmly cries, Woe is me, for I am undone. Interestingly, if you read through the chapter of Isaiah, verse chapter 5, you will notice that throughout the entire chapter, Isaiah is saying, woe to them. Woe to that group. Woe to those people. Woe to... But suddenly, his perspective changes. When he sees the glory of God, his focus is no longer on correcting everyone else, but instead he looks at himself. Woe, Lord, is me. And that prayer is heard. As we come into the presence of God, not only do we see ourselves, but more importantly, we see God for who he truly is. We see him as a God, yes, that reveals us as we are, but a God who already has the remedy. Isaiah, your lips are unclean. I have the solution. Whatever is in your heart, I can heal it. The solution is already provided by the Savior who is more than able to cleanse. We all know about grace. We've heard the story likely for many years. We know the theory, but have we accepted the light as our own? Moments later, the voice of God rings out once more. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Notice with me the immediacy with which this call is given. God does not tell Isaiah, now, now hold on a second, you were like just converted. Why don't you just sit down in the pew, see how long this conversion lasts, see if you can make it in your own strength and not sin anymore. Why don't you just do that? And then if you succeed, then I'll call you into service. Is this how God responds? Immediately upon Isaiah surrendering his life to God, God says, beautiful. I have a plan. I have a purpose. Your life is valuable to me. It has meaning. Maybe some of us have felt as though we have to prove ourselves to God, as though we have to do this much in order to look good in his sight. And God says, I see you. I love you for who you truly are in me. Without any questions, Isaiah responds, Here am I, send me. My husband and I have been married for less than two years, a little over, or about a year and a half now. And when, of course, it's recent enough that I still remember when he asked me out on our first date, And I don't know about you, but like, you just want to pull out the list with 500 questions out of your purse and just be like, all right, let's get this over with. Forget the flowers, forget the chocolate, like, let's get to business. Are you going to work? Is this going to be the one? Those those are the questions you you want to ask. Oh, I did not pull out a list, but I I guarantee he superseded it. But those questions, you, you want to know what are their interests? What are their values? Do they like pineapple on pizza? All of those non-negotiables that must be established for a happy marriage. Likewise, if you go for a job interview, most certainly, or at least I should hope, you are asking your 
possible uh, employer. When would the job begin? What are my expectations? Who do I report to? What would I make? These are natural and important questions to ask. And yet here, astoundingly, Isaiah asks no questions. He does not ask, well, God, when? God, where? God, this? God, he doesn't ask a thing. He simply responds, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. Initially, we may wonder if this lack of questions could come from Isaiah's recollection of the life of King Uzziah. You see, King Uzziah, as was mentioned in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, the king that had recently died, that king had decided to rebel against God, to blatantly disregard his commands, forcing his way into the temple and performing a service of which he had no part. And as a consequence of his choices, King Uzziah was struck with leprosy. The remainder of his years were not in his glory, but rather in the shame, as he died alone and suffering. Is this why Isaiah didn't ask any questions? Is his response simply, yes, sir, here I am, let's go, out of fear? And yet that is not the context in which this passage is given. Rather, it paints a very different picture. It's as though the conversation actually does not include Isaiah. He is simply eavesdropping when God is saying, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah throws up his hand like a little boy trying out for the baseball team. Pick me! Pick me! Here I am! Pick me! And Isaiah responds to the call. In contrast to King Uzziah, Isaiah's ears were attuned to God. So when he heard God call, he could respond. He had pressed into the presence of God. He had seen his glory. He had surrendered his life to him. He had repented to God. He'd been healed by God. And now he could come and say, God, if you have work to do, if there's service, if there's ministry, God, please, please pick me. Here I am. Lord, send me. He implored God, much like the two discouraged believers on the road to Emmaus, who would never have known that that anonymous stranger was actually the risen Lord, unless they had pressed him to come home to dinner with them. And yet how easy it is for us to run in and out of the presence of God. We have these burdens that we may be carrying, and yet we come to God praying only for a blessing on the food in the day. Instead of pressing into his presence, lingering at the throne of grace, not getting up until that burden is lifted, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will, not I might, I will give you rest as we press in to the presence of God. Do you have a lonely soul today? God responds, I'm the one who fills it. Is your heart broken? He's the healer. Are you searching for meaning, for purpose? He has the answer. Whatever burden you carry, 
He has the solution. And how often he replies, that's not your burden to carry. That's mine. Give it to me. And I will carry it for you. Not a moment in his presence as we hastily speed by, but pressing closer into his glory. Isaiah beautifully modeled this in the passage of Isaiah 6. And it's demonstrated in the acronym of PRAY. P, praise. R, repent. A, ask. And Y, yield. It's a beautiful tool if you're wishing also, as we've gone through this prayer conference, another tool that we can take with us to press deeper into the presence of God. We come to God with praise, seeing him as the God that he is, thanking him for the blessings that he has bestowed. And as we see God, we too may be led to that repentance, confessing where we have fallen from him. Next, Isaiah asked, he asked for healing, for an anointing of his lips, and finally yielding ourselves once more before the throne of grace. Together, like Isaiah, we can pray. A few years ago, I had the opportunity of meeting a woman who I will refer to as Ruby. Ruby was attending some meetings we were having at church, and she was attending faithfully every single evening. Remember, after one of the programs, a friend of mine came up to me and said, hey, Carissa, Ruby doesn't have a ride home tonight, so I told her you could give her a ride. So there I was, late at night, taking Ruby to her home. And as I continued to drive down into the, the middle of town, do you know those areas where you instinctively lock the door? That was the place, those were the streets, that she called her home. You see, Ruby was a prostitute selling herself for drugs, for love, for affection, selling herself. And yet she continued to attend the meetings each night. And I remember the night when an altar call was given and when Ruby came forward accepting Jesus Christ as her personal savior. And yet a few nights later, the joy I had once seen was replaced with fervent tears. As I sat beside her and asked her, what happened? Ruby began to explain she said, I, I've just done too much for God to forgive me. I'm, I'm a prostitute. I was a drug addict. I, I, I've just done too many things. There's no way that I can ever be good enough for God. Carrying the shame of her past. And I turned to Ruby and I said, Ruby, God has a message that he wrote specifically for you. Opening up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, we read, If any person is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Tonight, Ruby, when Jesus looks, looks at you, he does not see your past. He does not see shame. When Jesus looks at you, he sees his beloved daughter in whom he is well pleased. Do you believe that this morning? And so also in our lives, that promise is ours. As we come before God, as we see his glory, as we confess our sins to him, God says, my grace is so much greater. My power is so much stronger. Leave your burdens with me and I will carry them. 
His words remain true today. My prayer is today that we too can echo the words of Isaiah as we see the incredible grace of God so beautifully pictured on the cross. We too, like Ruby, can claim the promise that we are a new creation in Christ. And that awareness motivates us, it calls us, it propels us to action. Out of a desire, a yearning desire to tell others that they too are loved, that they too are valuable, that they too have a life of meaning. And so today we too can join Isaiah in saying, here am I, Lord, send me. Where will I go, you may ask? I don't know. It could be to another country. It could be to another state. It could be to your neighbor that's lonely down the street. It could be to your coworker that's experiencing burnout or just went through a loss. It could be simply down the hallway to hug your spouse, to hug your child, and to reveal the love of God to them. Where will you go? I don't know. God knows. But one question yet remains. To what length will you travel to be the light? Thank you.
uniting lives. Blessing nations. Welcome to this special Mother's Day edition of Week in Review right here on the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Sheila Hodgkins is off on assignment, but Ganim and I are here to uh, give you the update of what's been going on behind the scenes of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network this week. Uh, we have the verses of the day that is uh, coming up, but uh, let me introduce to you today's sponsor of the live broadcast of the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network here in Sabbath. Uh, thanks to the Knight family from Oklahoma. Also the Nuremberg from California. And from Florida, the Clayton Patrick family and of course uh, the Masseys there in Florida. So thank you so much for your support. And these are just a few of the names that uh, contribute to the LLBN uh, daily support. But these are special. Why? Well, because they're part of the live broadcast. Now, one would say, how do I become part of the live broadcast announcement? It's really more of a rotational uh, process. We try to give everyone the opportunity to have their name uh, service on spo uh, Sabbath sponsorship live. That's our peak time for viewership from Friday night through Saturday night. So uh, we just like to take the opportunity during the live hours to make this announcement. But right now it's time for the verse of the day, uh, or shall we say verses, get them? Yes, mm -hmm. verses. Well, you know, with Mother's Day being a great occasion for all of us, one here comes from Exodus, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. Well, you know, um, we all need to honor our mothers, whether we're men or women. Honoring our mother and father is very critical. And uh, this is Mother's Day weekend, and, and our mothers deserve special love and attention and recognition, which we should be doing all the time, Marlon, all the, all the time. But uh, it's a great day to reset our, uh, our, our, our compass to say, remember your mother. Mm, public recognition. Yes, sir. There's another one from uh, Proverbs 1, 8, 9. It says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. How important that is. And, and so truthful because I grew up in a home. Uh, my mom was pretty much the teacher of life for me. Uh, she set a perfect example. She laid the instruction. She made it clear that all came in combination with great love. Uh, so uh, mother teaching is very, very important. And thank you moms for mm -hmm. taking time out of your life and devoting your life to teach your children. And fortunately some of that is disappearing in some areas of the world and cities. Uh, but through God's grace, we still have wonderful and faithful <clears throat> mothers out there who does provide good foundation for their children. Well, the Bible tells us that um, we are to live Jesus Christ all day long. Uh, we're supposed to wake up with uh, thoughts of him to tell our children, and not only our children, but our spouse and our brothers and sisters and uh, our right. mothers. And, and that instruction is so pivotal because the early years are the formation years. Yeah. The Bible ta talks about training up a child in, in the way of the Lord, and yes. if he departs, he, sh he will return. That's my story, as a matter of fact, mm. uh, and that's your story as well. Mm. What else do you have for about mothers? Well, again, I'm, 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 I'm using verses here just to identify love, and I associate love with faithful mothers who love their children. Uh, John 15, 12 says, this is my commandment, this is from Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. And this is where a mother comes to mind because most mothers that I've known in my lifetime, they have made huge sacrifices for their children and they have loved, they have loved their ch children dearly. And uh, so this verse just kind of remind me of the love God has given to humanity. Um, in John 15, 13, it says greater Love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So it's just wonderful, God's love 
Jesus speaks of love. He gives a commandment of love. God speaks of love. And the greatest source of love that we all experience come from mothers. So we love you and we respect you. All mothers out there, LLBN, salute you for the wonderful job you have done for your family. Uh, you do your best, and of course, the rest in the hands of the Lord, uh, how the children will grow mm. and how they become to be. But thank you. Thank you for being in our lives. Thank you for nurturing us. Thank you for not only loving your children, but loving, supporting your ministries and your local churches and so many other organizations throughout our communities. Mm. Well, I'm uh, pretty lucky because uh, my mom lives in Loma Linda. So happy Mother's Day tomorrow, Mom. Uh, thanks for watching LLBN. <laughs> thanks for your support as well. Yeah. Well, well, my mother has passed, so uh, yeah. I look forward for the day mm -hmm. when the Lord will reunite us in his kingdom. And you said your mother is, is passed, but I got some great news for you. Okay. The prayers of your mother are still being heard. The prayers that she offered for you and your siblings... God still That's right. hears them according to That's the right. spirit of prophecy. That's right. I mean, it makes sense. You know, what's recorded in the books of heaven, prayer request, uh, it doesn't, those chapters don't close. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's how I see God. God is, is of just and God does not forget and God that keeps going. So uh, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. that with me and our viewers. Well, let's talk about uh, the Christian Connections. Uh, last week, we had a, a really special uh, edition. Uh, we had the uh, president of the Middle East and North Africa Union Mission uh, spend the hour with us. His name is uh, Rick McEdward. And uh, the guy is really a, a dynamic. I was fortunate to meet him with you uh, on, yeah. on the last edition of uh, Christian Connections. Yeah. We found a lot in common, Marlon, but one in particular common grounds we found that we have the Arabic, uh, uh, and Arabic channel that broadcasts in Arabic throughout the world and the Middle East. And there was a connection there on that since he does represent that region. So we're uh, looking forward to big things from uh, the conference here um, in the uh, North Africa Union mission. Uh, Alexander Archer, very good singer, provide the music for last Tuesday's Christian Connection along with the service uh, from Rick McEdward. Uh, you can see it this evening and uh, tomorrow and once more on Tuesday before we do the live edition uh, in the evening at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And uh, then we'll be fe featuring next Tuesday uh, Walt Nelson. I'm sure many of you know him. He's been uh, in the ministry for decades. Um, he's going to uh, be talking about love. <laughs> we all need more love in this world. That's what Jesus is all about. Uh, music from Seventh Day Strings. They've been here before, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, that uh, on the next edition of Christian Connections. Well, Friday Night Live is uh, coming up uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Let's see, Robert Edwards, out of the box. You know who Robert Edwards is? He's a fine presenter. Elder Robert Edwards, out of the box, with the music by uh, Paulette Jumalon and um, Joshua T., uh, as usual. So don't miss it. Uh, really great message. Well, again, let's uh, talk about the special outreach that we have going on. Yes, Marlon, today I'd like to highlight a program that I think most of our viewers may not know that it exists. It's called LLBN Sermons, where we edit out all the fantastic sermons being given here on LLBN and package into series that plays throughout the week highlighting those sermons. So you will likely to catch not only your favorite pastor, but you will discover many that you may have not listened to. So check out the times on the screen, and, and I think you'll find out when you tune into those series, you will be extremely blessed by the Word of God through the teaching of these individual ministers. And after you uh, have the Word to uplift you, uh, you can also go uh, to the app, the music app that you 
have put it on, on uh, Facebook. On our website, yeah, yes. Yeah. People still asking a lot about that, Marlon. Mm -hmm. And I use it personally. It's a fantastic app. Uh, you, you just go to our website, uh, turn your computer on, type in LLBN.TV. It's on the homepage right below the player. You click on it, and you can listen to the most beautiful, beautiful, classic hymnal music. Uh, some just music and others with vocals. It's very uplifting, mm. and it's our gift to you, and it's part of you givers' gift to the rest of the world. Well, coming up uh, just in a couple of weeks, uh, May, May 31st, LLBN's new edition uh, dedication that uh, you don't want to miss. Now, again, I'm, I've uh, I've not seen the construction workers around uh, the building in, in the last couple of weeks. What's going on? Is that a complaint or, or a compliment? Well, uh, are we able to pay them? That's <laughs> <laughs> yes, Marlon, you're absolutely right. You have not seen construction <laughs> workers, neither have I, because we are done with the construction. Uh, the technology implementation phase is now and here. And that's a very complicated process. To get it all right, it probably take us to the end of the year. So we decided to fire up the place, to get it ready with some basic features, and come to you live to unveil the facility to you on May 31st. So mark your calendar, May 31st, 6 p.m. Uh, you'll see uh, a special on unveiling. There'll be special devotionals, prayers, dedication. Uh, it's a day of joy for us to honor God and honor his supporters who helped us build uh, this ministry. So uh, I'm really excited mm -hmm. and I can't believe I lived long enough to see <laughs> that day. And that was part of my daily prayers, Marlon, because this building came with a lot of hard work and sacrifices. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, thank you, Lord, for letting me mm -hmm. see in my mind the promised land for this ministry. Uh, uh, in May, on May 31st. Amazing to see what this property has been uh, turning into. Um, this is, uh, I'm sitting in a building that uh, was just a steel shed. In fact, it's still up there. Yeah, yeah. We just built over it. Yeah, around it, inside yeah. and out. Yeah, uh, and, you know, to have this new addition yeah. uh, for storage, that would be, yeah. it's, it's really amazing. You know what's most amazing? Mm -hmm. When I st stand out there or sit there, and look up, that used to be the sky above. Yeah. <laughs> and it was dirt yeah. underneath us. Yeah. And now it's a place of worship mm -hmm. for our Father and Creator where we can honor Him with better and greater mm -hmm. and more exciting programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, Adam, I just well, see... Do we say uh, hallelujah to that? Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. But I also know that, hey, we're past time here. Uh-oh, okay. Uh, here's a, a letter for you uh, to uh, close the program. Uh, it's from Jonathan in Indian, Indiana, and he writes, I'm sending my donation to support LLBN Arabic and its programming to this region of the world. May God give you courage and strength as you work for him to reach souls in the Middle East. Roberta, Roberta from Oklahoma says, uh, I like the health-related programs on SLS and the weekly Sabbath services from the University Church. I want to thank all of you for your hard work and dedication. Uh, again, Roberta and Jonathan, uh, would you like to have, say a special prayer? Father Jesus, who walked on the water, who performed miracles, who uh, created us, thank you for having so much people who loves your work and love your ministry and come together in unity to serve you. Bless both Jonathan and Roberta, Father, and, 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 and just be with them be with them and continue to let them be a blessing to the rest of the world through their support and their offering to this ministry. In your precious name we ask this. Amen. And now we continue live with the programming uh, from LLBN. University Church is up next. See you next time on uh, We Can Review.